What's up Chaos Shinobi here? Summary, Naruto is the eldest of four children. His triplet siblings have the power of the Nine Tails, but when Naruto is sick of being neglected, he meets someone that is unlike anything the ninja world has ever seen. Stronger slash smarter Naruto would release Naruto. Let's begin, Chapter 1, The Hidden Leaf Village is a beautiful place. Harsher Amasenju, the first Hokage, picked out the location along with his best friend Madara Uchiha. Together they establish the strongest of the elemental nations and pave the way for the rest of the world to follow. Here we find ourselves, overlooking the village hidden in the leaves from atop the very same mountain Madara Uchiha and Hashirama Senju once stood. Of course, there have been some changes made to the surrounding landscape. Now, down below, rather than a lush a green forest, there is a populous and thriving village. Shinobi and civilians interacting and living their lives. The village was always a happy place. Today marks the five years anniversary of the defeat of the nine-tailed fox at the hands of the fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze and his triplets. With the help of his wife, Kushina Uzumaki, the third Hokage, Hiruzen Sarutobi, and two of the three legendary Sanin, Tsunade Senju and Jiraiya the Dode Sage, Minato Namikaze was able to split the nine tails into three separate containers. One, his eldest daughter Mito, who was a carbon copy of her mother, his youngest daughter Narumi that had his hair and blue eyes and the other in his youngest son Menma. Menma had a similar body structure to Minato but Menma got his crimson hair and violet eyes he got from his mother. From the top of the Hokage monument you can see them walking through the streets to their favorite restaurant at Jiraku Ramen. Along the way, the villagers are all smiling at the sight of Minato, 26, and Kushina, also 26, parading through the busy streets with the prince and princesses of the leaf. Mito, Narumi and Menma are celebrating their fifth birthday before with some lunch at their favorite restaurant before they get ready for their birthday party. Each year they are showered with gifts from council and clan heads alike. This year they were excited because they would be starting training. They expected to get all of the best shinobi weapons and attire from their godparents, Tsunade and Jiraiya, and the other clan heads. But they had no idea what their parents were going to get them. They had tried to find out only to be told, it's a secret, but you're gonna love it. Whatever it was, both parents seemed to be excited about it. This feeling of joy and excitement rubbed off on everybody. Whenever the 10th of October rolls around, the entire village just seems happier. Well, all except for one. Atop the Hokage Monument, on the head of Toborama Sanju, we find Naruto Namikaze, the eldest child of Minato and Kushina Namikaze and heir to the Namikaze Uzumaki clan. Naruto had spent the day all alone, just like he spends any other day. His parents always ignored him for his younger siblings and the rest of the village seemed to follow. Today is his sixth birthday, but he was the only one who knew it. Every year he would wonder if his parents would remember. He wanted nothing more than to celebrate with his family and just have someone to be around, someone who loved him. While Minato and Kushina never directly tried to hurt him, he was always treated as an annoyance. He was constantly seen as inferior to his siblings and he couldn't understand why. Naruto learned a lot about himself on his fifth birthday. None of it was shared. Flashback, one year ago, Naruto was excited. He couldn't sleep all night because he was so excited for today. The day he turned five. This wasn't just your normal birthday, no, clan heirs are typically trained from the age of five on through their time at the academy so they can graduate at the top of their classes. Naruto had noticed that his parents never seemed to have an interest in him for as long as he could remember, but this would be the year he changed that. This year he would work hard and show that he will be the best clan heir you could ask for. Naruto ran downstairs to see his parents decorating the house with happy birthday signs. Naruto couldn't help but crack a 100 watt smile at his parents who were just noticing him. Ah, I knew you guys would remember, said Naruto, tears forming in his eyes from the sheer happiness that was flooding his system. Kushina and Minato exchanged a quick glance before looking at their son with a confused expression. Kushina spoke up first. Of course we wouldn't forget your brother's and sister's birthday. She came across as offended at the fact that her son believed she would forget such an important day. Naruto's eyes widened, horror and sadness quickly replacing happiness. W what do you mean, brother's and sister's birthday? Naruto choked out, holding back tears at this point. Minato was very confused now. First his son comes down, happy as can be, then Kushina talks about how they are prepping for the triplet's birthday and now he is on the verge of tears. It was at that moment Naruto knew, he was really nothing to them. His birthday, the one day a year that he was supposed to be happy, and his parents didn't even bother to remember it. The tears were flowing freely now as Naruto ran back upstairs and slammed the door. He couldn't believe what was happening. His parents forgot about his birthday. For as long as he could remember, 
he hadn't had a birthday party or been involved in the party with his siblings. But this year was worse. He knew deep down he shouldn't have gotten his hopes up, but couldn't help budget excited about being a part of his family. He didn't was extravagant presents like the triplets would always get. He didn't want big parties and hordes of guests. All Naruto wanted was to be accepted by his family, and they basically told him he was insignificant. Naruto cried for hours, no one ever coming to check on him. He heard when his siblings woke up and went downstairs to see their living room covered in decorations. The sound of laughter and happiness was like a knife to his heart. It only got worse at the party. Everybody treated Naruto like he didn't exist. He was treated like a bother and when the occasional visitor talked to him, it was always about his siblings. What's it like being related to the prince and princess of the leaf? Or how are Lord Menma, Lady Narumi, and Lady Mito today? Or the one that crushed his spirits like a nut in a nutcracker? I didn't even know Lady Mito. Lady Narumi and Lord Menma had a sibling. After realizing that no one would miss him if he left, he wandered into his parents' library. On the table, he saw a couple books laying out titled Introduction to Chakra Control, Beginner's Chakra Theory, and My Training Regimen. There were two copies of the last one. Naruto started to look through the books only sparing a brief glance at each page. Right as Naruto was looking at the last couple pages of Introduction to Chakra Control, Minato and Kushina walked into the room, each smiling. They saw Naruto looking through the twins' gifts and reacted naturally. Naruto! Don't touch that, it doesn't belong to you. Kushina's scream startled Naruto making him rip the page he had in his hand. The gates of hell were opened. Both Kushina and Minato started yelling at Naruto so loud the party downstairs stopped. Everyone present bore witness to one of the harshest verbal lashings ever given to anyone, let alone a five-year-old. They accused Naruto of being jealous of Brat, just being an all-around bother to them. Naruto couldn't look at them. He stared at the floor and cried. As the lashing intensified, Naruto could barely maintain his composure. He was muffling his sobs when his mom grabbed him by the face. Lowering herself to his level she continued, What the hell are you crying for? You break your siblings present and now you think you can get off if you just cry? Get out of my sight. I don't want to see you for the rest of the night. Kushina hollered, inches away from Naruto's face. Naruto dragged himself out of the library and to his room. He didn't sleep that night. Present time, as Naruto thought back he discovered two things. First, he has a photographic memory. All he needs is the slightest glimpse or exposure to something and he can remember as perfectly for the rest of his life. He remembered every single word his parents said to him that night. The mere memory of that night wrecked him emotionally. Naruto had made a few attempts to bridge the gap between him and his family. His father had started to train Mito, Narumi and Menma every day, oftentimes leaving his paperwork for the night so he can fully dedicate himself to the triplets. They weren't exactly quick learners. Minato was considered a prodigy and Kushina was one of the hardest workers on the face of the planet, so naturally they were able to rise through the ranks and become the two strongest ninja in the Hidden Leaf. They were also determined to make Mito, Narumi, and Menmai as strong as possible, for the fate of the world rested on their shoulders. Naruto remembered hearing about some prophecy pertaining to the triplets, but little did he know that was the reason he was pushed aside. Flashback one week after the Nine Tails attack. Are you absolutely sure Jiraiya? Asked a troubled Minato, sparing a worried glance at his wife. Jiraiya had just rushed back from an emergency summons to Mount Mayaboku. The Toad Sage had important news he needed to share with Minato immediately. Jiraiya had received a prophecy from the Toads about Minato's and Kushina's children. According to the Elder Toad's foresight, a child of the Yellow Flash and Crimson Death would use powers never seen before to bring the world into an era of either peace or chaos. Immediately Jiraiya believed it to be either Mito, Narumi, or Menma since they would be trained in how to harness the power of the Nine Tails. The only previous container, Mito Uzumaki, yes, in this story, Kushina was never the Jin Chiriki of the Nine Tails, hence she survived the attack on the leaf, had never been able to do much more than suppress the beast. The fact that the power was a split up into two containers would make the chakra usable and maybe the triplets would one day master their power. Jiraiya had believed completely forgot the eldest child of the Namikaze Uzumaki family. There isn't a doubt in my mind. One of the triplets will be the child of prophecy. We need to do all we can to put them down the path of peace and not chaos. That means they need 100% of our attention. Kakashi, Tsunade, the two of you and I will have to do everything in our power, make the village see them as saviors and not monsters, train them to fight so they can handle the hardships they are destined to face, and above all else keep them happy. We can't afford to have the child of prophecy fall into darkness, Jiraiya said with unwavering conviction. His words rallied Kushina for the upcoming tasks, Minato still had some worries. What about Naruto? Minato said. The others in the room could sense the worry in his voice. 
He and Naruto had bonded within the year since his birth. Naruto was a carbon copy of Minato. Minato had never felt as happy as the day of Naruto's birth. All the accomplishments and praise he received meant nothing to him. The undying love he felt for his child was unlike anything he had ever experienced. Never having parents of his own, Minato wanted nothing more than to have a family when he was growing up. He had the love of his life with him and was able blessed with a healthy son. He would never forget the day, October 10th. It was the day he was completed. He had a son to bond with, tell stories to, tease, and do everything he never got to. Now, Jiraiya was telling him to put Naruto aside for his new kids. Now don't get him wrong, he loved Mito, Narumi, and Menma just as much as Naruto, but he knew what it means to be alone in the world, and he wouldn't wish it on his worst enemy. He had to deal with it because his parents had died in the Second Great Ninja War. The day of their funeral, a five-year-old Minato vowed that he would become strong enough to defend those close to him. He would protect his family and never abandon them to the cruel shinobi world they lived in. Looking at Jiraiya as if daring him to say the wrong thing, Minato awaited an answer. Kushina beat Jiraiya to the punch, hell no. We are not going to abandon him. He is as much our child as Mito, Narumi, and Menma, we just need to focus on the triplets a bit more. Flashback end. Hokage office. A bit more. Minato thought to himself as he signed off on his and Kushina's gift to the triplets. Minato deeply regretted not shooting down that prophecy nonsense as soon as Jiraiya brought it up. Every time he saw Naruto his heart broke a little. His eldest seemed to be completely broken. Minato would often catch Naruto watching the triplets interact with his family and friends. His eyes full of remorse and longing. The Namikaze name carries merit and power all around the world. Minato had built a legacy for his children to build from. But you wouldn't think that Naruto was Namikaze by the way he is treated. Most of the village had forgotten he even existed, and those that didn't gave him the moniker of the other Namikaze. When Minato heard that it took Jiraiya, Tsunade, and Kushina to keep him from killing the civilian council member that addressed Naruto in such a way, he wasn't the only one with doubts. Kushina, while stubborn and headstrong, wasn't entirely sure this was the best course of action. It pained her to see Naruto heartbroken, but she knew that the fate of the entire world was in the balance. She kept telling herself that she just had to make it to the triplets' fifth birthday. Then they would start training the triplets. Kushina figured when they started training the triplets things would be easier. She would fully devote herself to Mito, Narumi, and Menma and she wouldn't have time for anything else. She never went back on her word, and on the day Jiraiya came to her and Minato with the prophecy, she vowed to be the light for her Mito, Narumi, and Menma. She wouldn't allow them to slip into darkness. The pain she felt in her heart never faded though. It got harder and harder for her to see Naruto so much so that she would often blow up at anything Naruto did and send him away. Her emotions often shifted from sadness to anger in the blink of an eye. Naruto would often get scolded over minor things because Kushina needed to vent some of the anger she held for herself. She figured eventually things would smooth out with Naruto. Today the triplets would start training. Mito was always self-motivated, but would get discouraged easy and Menma's laziness rivaled that of Inara. Narumi was always kind-hearted and trying to make everyone happy. It killed her to see Naruto sad all they needed to come up with a way to keep them focused and something to remind them to push on when their training was hard. She had come up with it and convinced slash forced Minato into going through with it. Tonight was going to be a big night. Party at the Namikaze compound, yes, they have a compound, not just a small house like in canon. Tonight, was very important for all the Leaf residents. To score points with the Hokage. Many civilians and shinobi alike would pull out all the stops and get only the best gifts for Mito, Narumi, and Menma. One year, Minato wanted to turn away the gifts, but Kushina rejected the notion, saying they weren't his gifts to return. Wanting to keep the triplets happy, he complied, albeit reluctantly. This year was the worst yet. In the back corner of their rather lavish living room stood three mountains of gifts. One for Mito, one for Narumi, and one for Menma. If one were to look to the left of the impressive stacking feet, they would see the eldest Namikaze. Naruto was sitting at the end of the stairs in a plain black shirt and dark gray shorts. His messy blonde hair shadowed his eyes from all the partygoers. He was forced to attend the party every year, as if to rub in his face the fact that his siblings got more than he could ever dream of, while he got nothing. No love. No acceptance. No real family or friends. A single tear ran down Naruto's face over his trademark whisker birthmarks, three on each side. He was pulled from his agony by his mother speaking up to gather everyone's attention. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate you all taking the time to come and celebrate Mito, Narumi, and Menma's fifth birthday, Kushina said with a beautiful smile on her face, 
reminding many why she was one of the most sought-after maidens in the elemental nations. Anything for the prince and princess of the leaf. A rather drunk civilian slurred out sincerely. Kushina's smile widens as she looks back at Mito, Narumi, and Menma sitting next to each other with Minato to the right on Menma with Narumi to his left, and Mito to her left. We are going to start opening gifts, so please if you would do this orderly, we wouldn't want a repeat of last year. Kushina warned with smile that promised pain to anybody who ruined Mito, Narumi, and Menma's big day. Minato laughed nervously. He remembered what his wife had done to a few civilians that rushed to share their gifts and ended up running into an end table and breaking her favorite vase. The crowd remembered too, so they organized themselves into a line, civilians first then Shinobi second. Naruto watched with envy basically oozing from him. He watched as his siblings received top-of-the-line training gear, masterfully crafted weapons, jutsu scrolls, and countless books pertaining to combat intelligence and chakra theory. His siblings were well-mannered for the most part. Some of the books got a disapproving look from Menma but with a dangerous glare from Mito and Narumi, he quickly shaped up. Now their godparents were approaching them, each holding the ceiling scroll. The twins' eyes widened to the size of dinner plates as Jiraiya and Tsunade laid the scrolls on the table, and gesturing for the twin to sign them. With a childish glee, Menma signed the Toad contract and began yelling about how he would become the strongest shinobi ever. Mito and Narumi were much more reserved but still wore a rather large smile as they signed the slug contract. The room was in shock. All the shinobi had heard stories about two of the strongest summons clans, the toads and slugs. They also knew that only a handful of people in history had signed those contracts, putting the prince and princess in some very good company. The onlookers started to applaud as Kushina and Minato rose from their seats. As they were walking to the front of their children. Naruto noticed that his father was holding something in his hand that had the official seal of the Hokage on it. A little curious, Naruto rose and inched his way through the crowd until he was directly behind his parents. When he got there, he could clearly hear something that would change his life forever. Minato quieted the crowd and noticed his eldest had made his way to the front row. A moment of eye contact with Naruto made Minato consider scrapping this entire idea. He wasn't sure he could this to him in the first place. But to do it at a time like this, in front of all the important figures in the village? That would make things immensely harder. Mindo thought that maybe, by some chance, this whole ordeal would go over Naruto's head, he was still a child after all. Stealing his resolve, Minato decided to continue. I would like to thank you all for the gifts and on behalf of my entire family, I hope you enjoyed the night and we can celebrate like this many more times in the future. Minato cracked a charismatic smile that was reciprocated by the entire crowd. For some reason, Naruto got the feeling that something terrible was about to happen. Looking around he didn't see anything out of place around the room so he decided to curb his thoughts and return his attention to his father. We just have one last gift to give to Mito, Narumi, and Menma tonight. Naruto narrowed his eyes, the foreboding feeling returning, but this time much, much stronger than before. As the fourth Hokage of the village hidden in the leaves, I, Minato Namikaze, name Mito Namikaze Uzumaki the heir of the Uzumaki clan. Narumi Namikaze Uzumaki the heir of the Namikaze clan, and will personally be training Menma so he can one day take my place as Hokage. The crowd reactions were mixed. The overwhelming majority erupted into a craze of cheers and clapping. Some even went as far as to whistle and scream like they were celebrating a victory in the Chunin exams. A select few knew what this meant. Shukaku Nara, the Nara clan head and his son Shikimaru stared in disbelief. They knew Naruto and even kind of liked the boy. He was kind and warm-hearted to everybody but his eyes held a sadness that is indescribable. They didn't really know what caused the sadness, but now they got their answer. A couple in the crowd looked on stoically. Hyashi Hyuga and Fugaku Uchiha seemed indifferent towards the news. Behind Minato, Jiraiya and Tsunade were hugging and congratulating Menma and Mito respectively. Both children were the happiest they had ever been in their life. Menma was shedding tears of joy while he buried himself into Jiraiya's chest, laughing and smiling the entire time. Mito was uncharacteristically expressive too. She was smiling and openly laughing with Tsunade, going as far as to jump off her chair and into Tsunade's waiting arms. Narumi ran and gave her father the biggest hug imaginable. The celebrations were cut short when there was a sudden explosion of chakra in front of them. All eyes widened at the display of power and jaws became acquainted with the floor when they saw who was emitting this suffocating presence. In the center of the room stood Naruto, shooting a glare at his father that would turn Medusa to stone. Around him whipped vicious wisps of light blue chakra, tearing up floorboards and blowing back civilians and shinobi that were unfortunate enough to be nearby. His eyes held pure rage and betrayal, while his body released more chakra than the average Jonin. His parents looked at him with wide eyes, for several reasons. 
the first of which was they didn't know that Naruto had awoken his chakra. Secretly Naruto had been training in chakra control and studying chakra theory at the public library. He naturally was able to mold his chakra easily, making the tree walking exercise and water walking exercise child's play for him. He had even asked Tsunade for some basic medical ninjutsu he could train in, but was sharply denied. The second reason was the sheer amount of chakra he was emitting. While the Uzumaki blood ran strong in his veins, even a full-blood Uzumaki's chakra reserves were dwarfed by Naruto's. If he has the equivalent to a Jonin at the age of six, what will he be like when he gets out of the academy? Or even after that? Or even after that? Mayando's thoughts were almost identical to the thoughts of Tsunade, Kushina, and Jiraiya. Naruto cut their thoughts short as he took a step forward, the wood floor splintering under his feet. Excuse me? said Naruto, far too calmly for the situation he was in. If I heard you correctly, you just took away the only thing that this family has ever given me. Naruto continued to walk towards his parents, snapping them out of their trance. Naruto, you don't understand. We were just Kushina was cut off when Naruto's chakra jumped up to a whole other level. Kakashi looked at Naruto in awe. He's radiating more chakra than I have. He was interrupted from his thoughts when Naruto spoke again. I don't understand? I don't understand? Naruto yelled, releasing even more of his stored chakra, shattering windows and blowing everything in the house away like a tornado. Let me tell you what the fuck I understand. None of you care about me. You ignore me for years because of those three and now you take the only thing I ever had. The only thing that ever proved that I existed. Naruto continued as tears were flowing freely down his face. Do you know what today is? He asked his parents. Most of the crowd was trembling at this point from the sheer churka being whipped around the room. Do you? Naruto hollered, making everyone in the room wince. At a loss for words, Kushina and Minato tried to talk but nothing came out of their mouths. The sadness and neglect in Naruto's eyes was replaced by pure rage. Minato's eyes widened in realization but before he could speak, Naruto did. Today's my birthday. Naruto yelled so loudly even a certain pink-haired banshee councilwoman was shocked. The room fell into a state of disbelief. Minato and Kushina stared at their son. Shock, sadness, self-loathing, all fighting for control over their emotions. Now they understood why Naruto always acted the way he did on this day. For five years, it hadn't been his birthday, it had been the triplets' birthday. Never had he be acknowledged alongside the triplets, he had always been alone in the shadow of the triplets. He wasn't there voluntarily. He was put there by his parents and godparents. Their obsession with the prophecy and the triplets had made it impossible for him to get the one thing he wanted. Love. He felt unwanted by his parents and unloved by his godparents. He was sick of it. He may be six, but he had the intelligence of an academy graduate. He was a genius, a prodigy, but his parents wouldn't have known. They never took an interest in him. Naruto remembered all of it. Each painful rejection, each unwarranted chastising. All of it was burned into his mind because of his photographic memory. Tears started to fall from his parents' eyes, but Naruto didn't notice. Maybe it would just be better if I just didn't exist, Naruto yelled as the entire house was enveloped in a bright flash and when everyone recovered Naruto was gone. Minato was the first one to snap out of his days. Anbu, he yelled uncharacteristically loud. In the blink of an eye there were four masked figures in generic Anbu garb kneeling in front of him. Find him. Please find my son. As soon as Minato finished, the Anbu dispersed, mobilizing four battalions of Anbu and other shinobi to find the eldest Namikaze. Minato turned to his family to see a troubling sight. Instead of the happy laughing children he has seen moments ago, Mito, Narumi, and Menma were trembling and being comforted by the two Sanin. Then he looked to the left and saw his wife, she was a combination of sad and enraged. She was in a heap on the floor crying. Rethinking everything they had done to this point, Minato could only hope that his Anbu found Naruto before he did anything to harm himself. Top of the Hokage Monument A very drained and pissed off Naruto laid flat on top of the second Hokage's stone face. His emotions were a hurricane of sadness, rage, and disappointment. He had trained himself into the ground for the past year to try and impress his parents. He just wanted to be accepted by his parents and godparents so he trained. Every waking moment was dedicated to bettering himself and further enhancing his natural abilities. This wasn't how he wanted to reveal them. He just wanted his family to be happy for him. He just wanted them to be proud of him, not treat him like a nuisance. Naruto cried quietly to himself, looking off the edge and considering jumping. He was interrupted by a ruffling in the bushes behind him. He expected it to be one of his father's anbu but was surprised when instead he came face to face with a particularly unique character. In front of him stood an 18-year-old who looked like he was in his early 20s. 
He had shaggy brown hair that sat in a sort of organized chaos on top of his head. He stood just shy of six feet, and wore black sweatpants that covered his legs completely. Instead of the usual shinobi sandals Naruto had grown accustomed to, the stranger wore jet black combat boots to match his sweatpants. His torso was covered with a dark gray muscle shirt. Black straps could be seen wrapped around his body supporting the sheath for two nine-inch black bladed bowie knives. The stranger was spinning one in his hand like it was second nature. The knife whipped around his hand in a blur, but looked completely natural. The hilts were a vibrant gold, while the handle was covered in black leather. The knives were placed parallel to his spine and on either side. His build was on the larger side. His chest and stomach was out in the open, covered only by his skin-tight muscle shirt. The shirt did little to veil his battle-hardened body. His chest and abs were well-defined and you could make out every detail in his arms. His body is like Captain America as soon as he got out of the pod. Over everything he wore a brilliantly gold cloak that was open in the front and rimmed with black outlines and accents along the edges and pockets. He had a weird design on the back of the cloak that looked like a small Star of David within another larger Star of David. The stars were connected by many extravagant lines and tomos encircling the design. The design was perfectly symmetrical as if it were meticulously created. Around his neck was a golden necklace with a white gold anchor charm in the center of his chest. Lastly, on his back were two identical swords. Each had a handle that was a quarter of a meters, covered in black leather like the knives on his back. The blades were exactly one meter long. The hilts were covered by some sort of medical bandage that sealed the swords in their sheaths. The details of the blades remained secret to any onlooker. His neck was exposed showing a few nasty-looking scars that seemed to run down onto his torso. His face and jawline were very prominent, lacking any kind of fat or excess weight. His face was absent of scars but his eyes were piercing. The gold around his pupils seemed to glow in the dim lighting of the forest. His eyes expressed wisdom beyond his age, interesting Naruto to no end. Naruto couldn't take his eyes off the man as he approached. His stature and demeanor demanded respect but it was well deserved. On top of the confidence that came off him in droves, he had the most welcoming aura Naruto had ever experienced. Something just made you want to be around him. As he got closer Naruto just seemed to be at ease. All the emotions that were running rampant in his minds were all calmed in his presence. He carried himself like a deity, his steps making no noise. The moonlight reflected off his cloak to give his overall appearance the mystical feel. You know I've thought about it too. The mysterious stranger said as he took a seat next to the still standing Naruto. He continued with his gaze fixed on something in the distance. How easy it would be to just end things now. Nobody would miss me. All the pain I feel would finally end. I wouldn't be alone anymore. Naruto noticed his neighbor's eyes changed from welcoming and comforting to extreme sadness. What did you have to go through to carry that much sadness? It turns out somebody else had different plans. The man said with a slight chuckle as he took the knife in his right hand rolled up his left sleeve to his elbow, and cut his left wrist all the way down his veins. As blood started to pour out Naruto began to panic. In a shaken hurry, Naruto grabbed his arm and tried to apply pressure to the wound. As he pushed down he felt something shifting under his hand. As Naruto removed his blood-soaked hand from the stranger he watched in awe as the wound rapidly closed, leaving a bit of steam as the skin reconnected. Naruto looks up to meet the eyes of the stranger, his eyes begging for answers. His curiosity was met with a low chuckle from the stranger. Imagine my shock when I jumped of a building to end it but everything grew right back just like before I landed. He fixed his sleeve and returned his gaze to Naruto. The look of compassion and acceptance had returned. It took me trying it to realize it was the right choice. People like you and me, we may be pushed aside. We may get left out or ostracized. We may be hated and even hunted to the ends of the earth. But it's our responsibility to do as much good as possibility. We can't let their ignorance and stupidity be our downfall. The man stood up and walked away from the edge. Once he was about 10 feet from the edge he extended his right hand and opened his palm. In a flash of brilliant rainbow-colored flame, the same flames as the dragons in Avatar, the last airbender, a two-meter golden staff appeared in his hand. Upon closer observation one would notice the black indentions running all through the length of the staff. The tip facing Naruto had what looked like spread eagle wings, and in between the two wings was a gem that was constantly shifting colors like it was alive. On the back end there was another gem, but this one was pitch black, making it look almost like the tip of a kunai. I see too much of myself in you, Naruto. I see the pain and sadness in your eyes that I carried when I was your age. I want nothing more than to help you, to give you the one thing you always wanted. The man said as he turned to Naruto with his left hand extended. I'm asking you to trust me. If you want to be strong, I'll make you the strongest shinobi on the face of the planet. If you want to travel the world, 
I'll take you along for the ride and we can see everything the elemental nations have to offer. As much as you want a family, I want one too, he said as he took a few steps toward Naruto, his left hand still extended. Naruto didn't know what to do. Just after his parents had finally confirmed his worst fears, he had this teenager come and offer him everything he ever wanted. Naruto wanted to be skeptical, if his own family didn't want anything to do with him then why would a stranger? As his internal war raged on, he didn't notice the man walk towards him and embrace Naruto. Every doubt he had in his mind was erased right there. He felt the sincerity in what the man had told him. He could feel the desire to help and tears began to form in his eyes. He had never been hugged like this by his family, they rarely spoke to him and outright avoided physical contact. In this man's arms, he felt something he hadn't in a while, a rush of every positive emotion he hadn't experienced in years, happiness, relief, and acceptance flooded his mind as he buried himself in the chest of this stranger. P thank you. Naruto choked out as he tried to maintain his composure. Ace. My name is Ace, the former stranger share. You aren't alone anymore. I will always be there for you, Naruto. Happy birthday, Naruto. Ace released his staff as it disappeared in the same flash it appeared in. He pulled out a necklace like his own from his right cloak pocket and put it around Naruto's neck. He then fully embraced the boy feeling many of the same emotions as Naruto. As tears fell from their eyes, they knew one thing. They weren't alone anymore. Chapter 2 Time skip 11 years. A 17-year-old, shirtless blonde rose out of bed at 7 a.m. like he had every day for the past decade. He walked out of his room and into the bathroom to go through his usual morning routine. When he got in front of the mirror he got a good look at himself. Long gone was his child body he had when he met Ace. It was replaced by the type of body girls can only dream of. The muscles of his chest and stomach looked like they were carved in granite. No real deposits of fat existed on his body, so with the absence of his shirt, you got to follow each individual muscle in all its movements. His muscles were much denser than a normal shinobi as well, making his skin seem like it is reinforced and hard to pierce. Below the belt, Naruto had legs that could carry him for days and not give out. His punches and kicks were strong enough to shatter bones like glass and pierce iron like paper, but his strength was something that he considered his weak point. Naruto focused more on speed. Without his resistance seals, Naruto was faster than the current rakage with his lightning armor active. Early in his training he realized that there were certain things he would never catch Ace in. Strength was one of those. Ace's bones were made out of some sort of metal that he boasted was the strongest metal in existence. Comparing Ace's strength to that of Tsunade Senju would be like comparing a professional weightlifter to a newborn. For the first five years, Ace wouldn't throw punches at Naruto in fear of permanently damaging him. As Naruto grew up, he naturally became tougher and stronger than anybody in his generation. All those ass kickings by Ace were at least good for something. Naruto could confidently say that he could best nearly everyone in a strictly taijutsu fight. He wanted to fight against Guy when he had opened the Eight Gates, but hadn't had the opportunity. Naruto didn't consider what he did as training. Ace was a slave driver and would work Naruto till he couldn't walk every day for the past 10 years. His body was constantly sore and his head always hurt from memorizing new things. Every day, Naruto was with Ace from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., working on whatever Ace had planned for the day. Usually, the first and last hour were used for meditation on the day's techniques. During this time, Ace would also funnel minimal amounts of his power into Naruto's system, allowing Naruto's body to adapt to the power over time. They would sit back to back and Ace would manifest what is power. Ace's power was unlike anything Naruto had ever seen or heard of. For one, Ace didn't use chakra. Instead Ace described his power as the ability to manipulate energy itself. He said that where he was from there were five kinds of people. The first of which had the rapid regeneration he had demonstrated the night they meant. The second group had the ability to control matter and energy with their mind, or telekinesis as Ace called it. This ability is what allows Ace to manipulate any type of ninjutsu style by manipulating the energy around him. No hand signs were required, all he must do is clap his hands together to balance the power he would put into the attacks. Imagine the way at an L transmutate in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Even the awesome little sound. While he could use every element on the level of the second Hokage's water style, the things Ace could do with fire, lightning, and wind amazed Naruto every time he saw them. Ace's fire required ridiculous amounts of water to put out and would burn hot enough to melt stone and steel like butter. He could mold it into almost any shape of form he could imagine. Naruto still had a few scars from when Ace chased him around with the rainbow fire tiger. Lightning and wind were just as remarkable. His telekinesis powers weren't restricted to energy. They could manipulate matter in the world that Ace's presence touched, excluding people and other living animals. 
he must touch animals and humans physically then he could move them with his mind. He could also summon beautiful golden and black vectors as Ace called them. The looked like giant 2D circles that had many designs around the center, think the magic circles from early on in Fairy Tale. These would appear wherever Ace designated. These produced a force that will push anything in front of it. Naruto had also noticed that Ace could manipulate his body with telekinesis as well. More than once Naruto had rushed Ace thinking he had an opening, only for Ace to contort his body around and land a bone-crushing hit to his jaw. The third power Ace had was telepathy. He could read the thoughts and sense the presence of anybody within a mile of him. He could alter the memories and reality someone would see if he concentrated hard enough. Naruto was put through a very intense mental conditioning thanks to this power. Now Naruto was impervious to all genjutsu thanks to the absolute mental defense Ace helped him build. Ace could also control someone if he makes eye contact. Looking into his eyes in a fight was like signing your own death sentence. This power got very annoying when they would spar, because Naruto constantly had to focus on hiding his thoughts from Ace or it would be a very painful experience. Eventually, blocking Ace's mental assault became second nature, but he could never find a way to escape after making eye contact when Ace used his oculus form. Ace's oculus form was very similar to the manga Kyosharigan, but had a few key differences. Rather than making the Susano, Ace was capable of transferring energy into a solid state for armor, walls, or anything else he could think of. Ace also had the enhanced perception and predictability that came with the Sharigan. He also had perfect 360 degree vision when he had it active. The design was the same as the symbol on Ace's back, which made sense to Naruto. Ace never told Naruto how he got those eyes. But Naruto didn't press the issue. Telepathy was the power Ace used the least because he didn't want to intrude on a person's privacy. He had developed a way to shut it off like a light switch and would leave it off for a majority of the time. His last power was Naruto's favorite. Ace had the power to teleport anywhere he had in his memory or could see. Like Naruto, Ace had a photographic memory, making it easy for him to travel great distances and an absolute pain in the ass to fight against. Whenever Ace would teleport it sounded like he was ripping his very existence from the earth and forcing it somewhere else, it is the sound of a sonido from Bleach. Ace always said that this was his favorite power. He could teleport himself, things he was touching, or things he had marked by placing his palm on them. The mark was the same one as his cloak. Ace's teleportation was the fastest thing Naruto had ever seen. Even his father's flying thunder god technique took a fraction of a second to travel to the seal. You couldn't predict where Ace would appear because he didn't rely on seals. Naruto would always love and hate this ability. It took five years for Naruto to unlock these abilities. Each one came in his time of need. He discovered the regeneration first when Ace punched him in the stomach for the first time. His insides were reduced to confetti, but he felt a heat all over his body then the pain started to fade. He watched with a combination of horror and awe as he watched his abdomen piece itself back together. While he still had to deal with the pain of his injuries, but from the loss of limbs to the removal of vital organs, Naruto always could regenerate. Ace warned him that he had to protect his spine, because that is where the basis for the regenerative power manifest. Naruto was happy to know his weakness and had already come up with a few ways to protect it. After repetitive regeneration, Naruto's bones also became much denser than they previously were. His bones were similar in strength to steel, but would still shatter like a vase if he took a direct hit from Ace. Naruto had discovered telekinesis when he was attempting to combine elements. Naruto's natural elements were wind and fire, which he mastered within the first three years of training with Ace. His mastery over fire was just like Madara Uchiha's and his mastery in wind allowed him to fly and manipulate air around him in ways few had ever been able to do. He was trying to recreate the first Hokage's wood progress was slow until he asked Ace for help at the age of 14. Ace had explained the concepts of energy manipulation for Naruto and walked him through combing two different types of energy together. When it was all said and done, Naruto was confident that the first would be proud of his skills in the wood style. On top of the wood style, Naruto also learned how to use the scorch style and ice style. He only learned these because of the attacks Ace could create and use against him. While not really interested at first, Naruto fell in love with these three styles. They were all very useful and only limited by the imagination of the user. Naruto had discovered his telepathy when he was trying to block one of Ace's mental assaults. He ended up turning the table on Ace and saw some of his memories. What he saw scarred him. He was scarred to go and poke around in other people's minds now so he followed what Ace did, and used his telepathy for fights only. He was never able to unlock the control power that Ace had, but he was glad about that. A power like that would be too tempting to use and Naruto didn't trust himself with something like that. Funny enough, Naruto had discovered his last power, teleportation, mid-ass kicking. 
while Naruto's base speed may surpass the rakage, when Ace put effort into his teleportation-style martial arts, Naruto looked like he was standing still. He was desperate to escape a situation in which Ace was repeatedly flicking him in the forehead. And for those that don't know, even Naruto's denser bones were cracked by flicks when Ace tried. Naruto loved everything about teleporting. Ace had helped him work it into different fighting styles, but Naruto was limited to places he could see or had placed his mark on. His mark was a simple chibi Naruto with a thumb up and his tongue sticking out. Ace and Naruto found it amusing. Ace had also taken full advantage of Naruto's photographic memory and taught him a lifetime's worth of martial arts skills in a decade. No matter the opponent, Naruto now had a style he could use to counter them. When you add in his teleportation and telekinesis enhancement potentials, the potential was staggering. Naruto noted many times how much stronger his punches and kicks were when he used telekinesis enhanced his muscles and bones before he struck. Hand to hand wasn't the only thing he trained over the years. For Naruto's seventh birthday, Ace made him two Bowie knives that were just a few inches smaller than his own, standing at 6 feet 3 inches slash 4 inches as opposed to Ace's 9 inch knives. That year they spent countless hours working on techniques and ways to incorporate the blades into his fighting style. Ace used them for quick and or quite kills. He also used these instead of kunai because he could just teleport them back to him or pull them back with his telekinesis. Naruto used them in a very similar fashion just didn't really like to throw them because he was usually fast enough to close the gap and wouldn't even have to bother throwing the knives. He knew Ace had specifically crafted all his weapons so wasn't going to change much from how Ace used them. For his 8th birthday, Ace made Naruto a staff like his own. It was the exact same in everything except for weight and the gems on the staff. While Ace's gems were a rainbow color on top and jet black on bottom, Naruto's top gem was gold but his bottom gem was black like Ace's. Ace's staff also weighed somewhere around 250 pounds, Naruto's was at a solid 75 pounds. The staff was Naruto's personal favorite. Everything about it just came naturally to him. He could even annoy Ace in a strictly B.O. staff fight. Ace showed him how to augment his staff techniques with minor telekinesis usage here and there. Naruto could summon and dispel his staff much like Ace, but he liked to carry it with him whenever his hands weren't full. On his ninth birthday, he received A the last of Ace's weapon set the twin blades on Ace's back. Once again Naruto's blades were shorter, by about a quarter of a meter this time. They fit him perfectly. He loved everything about them and while they were made of the same metal as Ace's, Naruto figured out that each of the weapons Ace made were from metal he had gathered from cutting off limbs and harvesting the bone. Naruto was a bit weirded out at first, but when he confronted Ace about it, Ace said that he trusted Naruto with the strongest substance in existence and wanted to give him only the best equipment to use. He said the only two with blades made from that metal were him and Naruto now. Ace was unrivaled in combat, nobody would ever be able to stand up to him in a fist fight. He had mastered countless styles and shared many of them with Naruto, but Naruto knew he stood no chance against Ace in a taijutsu fight. The second thing Ace was godlike it was his kenjutsu. Ace described the swords as being their own person. He talked about earning the trust of the blades, but Naruto just thought he was a bit crazy. Well at least he did until Ace unsheathed his blades for the first time. Ace had taken Naruto to a mountain range in the middle of Iron Country. When he took his swords out of their covers he sliced straight through the largest mountain in the range. The cut was perfect, clean and unlike anything in recorded history. He proceeded to show him the higher level techniques he had created which involved channeling his own energy, not chakra, into the blade and releasing it as a slash shaped projectile. The energy would either strengthen the blade or cut through anything in its path. Naruto had to regrow more than a few limbs when he was learning to use and block this technique. Naruto grasped the concepts of Kenjutsu very easily and was even able to pick up intermediate techniques and styles in three months. He spent the remainder of his time studying high-level techniques and incorporating his own personal touches to each style. The sword style Ace used was called the Dragon Stance. It fully incorporated the powers Ace had and was a combination of every other style Naruto had ever seen. By taking the best parts of each style and mashing them all together, Ace created a style with no weak points. This style was the hardest for Naruto to master because of the complexity of it. The style came natural to Ace because he had been able to use his powers all his life. In contrast, Naruto was still mastering his teleportation and telekinesis. He didn't have either mastered until he was 15. Even after mastering his powers, Naruto's abilities limited the potential of this stance. It would be years until he was truly a master of the dragon stance. On Naruto's 10th birthday, Ace sat down with him and spent the day answering any question Naruto had about his past, the training regimen, or anything else Naruto came up with. This conversation lasted all day and Naruto now knew Ace's life story. 
he explained to him the concepts of space and travel between planets. Ace also pointed out that many things were different in his world. His people aged a lot slower than Naruto's. Ace had deduced that for every year on Naruto's planet, he aged about a week or two. That explained why Ace had barely changed over the 11 years Naruto had known him. There were also minor changes, for example a year on Legion was 18 months rather than the 12 on Earth. Naruto was amazed by the technology Ace explained, metal boxes that could travel millions of miles, many times faster than the speed of light. Once Naruto had a basic understanding, Ace got into his life story. He talked about how he was born to a loving mother and father on a faraway planet called Legion. Legion was the center of an intergalactic empire that had ruled for 10,000 years. There had been three previous empires, the originals, predecessors, and transcendentals. Ace said that his people were descendants of the predecessors and overthrew the transcendentals in a long, bloody way. Ace described his home as very militaristic. They valued strength and your worth on a battlefield. Almost everyone had a legacy and were trained from the day their fourth birthday to fight. Every kid wanted to grow up and be one of the five commanders in the Legion army. There was one to represent each legacy group as well as those without legacies, but the unity of the army didn't end all conflicts. There were many violent outbreaks between divisions that would escalate into full-blown civil wars. There was one thing that made the people unite, an enemy greater than themselves. In Ligonian society, it was rare for one person to have two legacies. The odds were about one in a billion. They existed, and they often thrived in the military, but were kept around because they had a limited amount of power. There were about 100 dual legacy warriors in the army at the time Ace left. There were three people who had three legacies. Ace had fought the three of them when he was younger and upon defeating them, convinced them to leave behind the Ligonian army and fight for their own purpose, not the agenda of some politician that didn't care about them. Ace said that people like him were hunted down and killed at all costs. Ace talked about how he lived a happy life until he was five. Then his family was attacked by the Ligonian military in fear of what Ace could become. Ace's mother was a beautiful petite woman. She was just over five feet tall and was one of the smartest people in the entire empire. She was always hard on Ace, but he knew she only wanted him to succeed. Her name was Alejandra, or Alex for short. She was 25 when she died. His father was the only person that could mentally match his mother. He was a decent height of 5 feet 9 inches, and was a health nut. Most Ace's training was done with his dad. He loved it when his parents were together because they brought out the best in each other. His name was Kenneth. He died at the 24. He said the technical term for his different powers was legacies. Ace said the fear the normal warrior had for a legion, people with the ability to use all four legacies, was common and crippling. When he was four, Ace had awakened a few of his legacies and was seen using them at school. He was recruited into the military at a young age to ensure his loyalty, but his parents rejected the offer. They said that they wished for Ace to have a normal childhood and join the military at the normal age, 16. They didn't take too kindly to the rejection and began bullying his family into submission. Almost a year later, on Ace's fifth birthday, a military special ops team consisting of 12 dual legacy users, attacked Ace and his family. They treated it like a game, torturing Ace's family in front of him. The mentally tortured him by replaying the death of his parents repeatedly in his mind. They tortured Ace throughout the entire ordeal. The skinned portions of his body repeatedly and would cut out one eye, but leave the other so he could see what they were doing and while it grew back they would make him watch as they tortured his parents. Ace's parents didn't have any legacies, so their bodies could only withstand so much. When they died, the soldiers weren't satisfied yet. They tortured Ace for another five hours, then they heard a crying from the other room. Inside they found Ace's younger sister. The attackers dragged out the four-year-old by her solid black hair. She had tears in her eyes when she saw his parents dead on the floor and Ace's severed body parts strewn about the room. Ace said they had their suspicions she was a legion. But there hadn't been one since those two teenagers fled the Empire a few years back. It wasn't the fact that legions could master all four legacies that made them a liability. They were always of genius intelligence and had a state they could enter called their apex state. No matter how intelligent one becomes, the apex state throws that out the window. When in the state, a legion fights entirely on instinct. They increase their power and attack capacity exponentially, increase all their senses, and kicks all their legacies into overdrive. Ace said that he had trained in controlling the state, which made him able to fight with the killer instincts of the state, but also keep his wits, making him immeasurably more dangerous. As Ace watched his sister get her throat slit and bleed out in front of him, something snapped. Gun was the helpless child that was just learning his powers. Instead in his wake was a five-year-old juggernaut. His body erupted with white power that made those around fall to their knees. Ace showed Naruto the memory of the ensuing slaughter. It was automatic. 
Ace cut through the twelve commandos like a hot knife through butter. It was all over in the blink of an eye. Twelve of the Lagonian army's best lay dead at the hands of the newly awoken legion. After that, Ace fled the galaxy. He ran for years, slowly mastering his powers and gathering allies. He was trained by some of the greatest legacy masters in the universe. All of them took a liking to Ace, helping him in any way they could. They all died protecting him when he was cornered by the full might of the Lagonian military. At the age of 14 he met his first love. One of the unique things about legions and they always come in pairs. They always ended up meeting eventually. It was fate. She had a very different life than Ace. Her name was Olivia, and she grew up as the only child of a royal telepath family. She got everything she ever wanted and hadn't struggled with anything until she met Ace. He had broken into her house to get food after evading the local authorities. She was the one that found him and engaged him in a one-on-one -on -one duel. It was a rather one-sided affair. Olivia was completely outmatched, she had been pampered all her life and when she met her first real competition, she was anything but prepared. Ace had shown her the error in her ways and opened her eyes to some of the harsh realities they would have to face. While they had the same base abilities, Ace had far surpassed her. She knew that they would also have to stick together to survive. Her family couldn't hide her powers forever. In a knee-jerk decision, she chose to accompany him when he left. She kept in touch with her family but her life would never be the same. Ace told his story with a so much compassion. It scared Naruto how quickly Ace's eyes went from love to absolute sorrow. Naruto didn't push the topic after that, he figured something happened that lead to her absence. Whether it was a death or betrayal, Naruto felt like it was a story for another time. From that day on, Naruto felt much closer to Ace. He would confide in Ace and ask for advice with everything. Ace became more than just a friend to Naruto. He became a brother, someone so close so trustworthy that Naruto had finally found the one thing he always wanted. He finally had a family. On his 12th birthday Naruto got his first major test. Flashback Naruto's 12th birthday. Naruto got up a little early this morning, taking a trip down the mountain to a local market to pick up some food for them. When Naruto appeared in the center of the training room, arms full of grocery bags, he was instantly ensnared in chains, restricting all movement. The chains were split between gold and black and looked indestructible. Initially he believed that his mother had found him after all these years. He knew that his father had sent out search parties to find him, but Ace was used to evading people that were much better trackers than the Anbu. They traveled around the elemental nations, meeting people, learning about the world, and making memories that neither of them would forget. From time to time, Naruto would think about his old family. He wondered if they missed him at all. He hadn't seen them since they took away he position as heir to his clan. Naruto didn't regret his choice in leaving. He wished he had met Ace sooner. The thought of his parents and godparents still angered Naruto. He would have to return one day, but for the time being, he was going to stay with Ace and get strong enough to protect those he cares about. Scene change, Hidden Leaf Village. Things changed the night Naruto left. His family became very polarized. Narumi and Minato felt like they should be doing everything they could to find Naruto, while Kushina felt betrayed by Naruto leaving them. She knew he didn't have the easiest of lives, but for him to abandon his village and his family was against the Uzumaki way. She would rip him a new one when they found him. After five years, the search for Naruto started to take a backseat to their other responsibilities. The only one that thought of Naruto every day was Narumi. She always prayed to Kami, asking her to return Naruto to them. She wanted to fix the problems with their family, but Naruto left before she could even get the ball rolling. Mito and Menma seemed to hate Naruto for leaving. They never really understood why their parents always kept them separated, but they remember Naruto always trying to see them and be nice to them. Mito tried as hard as she could to forget the good times with Naruto, but she couldn't help but feel empty when she thought about how sad Naruto looked at her fifth birthday party. That wasn't the face she saw. She always saw the happy, goofy older brother that would cheer her up and shower her in love. She would frequently cry at the memory of Naruto but would never tell a soul. Menma was different from his sisters. He took Naruto's departure so personally that he developed a hatred for his brother. One day his parents found him burning all the pictures of Naruto and everything Naruto left behind, with tears streaming down his face. His parents tried to get him to talk about his feelings, but Menma closed himself off. He was determined to get stronger. He would find his brother and make the fool regret being born. The Namikaze Uzumaki children never wanted to celebrate their birthday anymore. They usually spent the day alone, training or reflecting on themselves. Their eyes had been open the day Naruto left. They had a new motivation. They were going to find their brother and bring him back.
one was or another. Flashback within a flashback Minato's home office, one year before Naruto's departure. Minato was at a particularly low point now. In front of him was Jiraiya ranting about how the Toad Sage had changed his prediction. Minato, we have to do something. The Sage is telling us specifically so we can make sure that we prevent anything bad from happening. The prophecy changed to the child of the yellow flash and crimson death. The child shrouded in darkness will use powers never seen before to mold the world how they see fit. We can't allow Mito, Narumi, or Menma to be shrouded in darkness. I don't care what we have to do at this point, this take priority. Jiraiya was worried. The term shrouded in darkness was never used in a good way. He had already talked to Tsunade about making Mito, Narumi, and Menma their only focus. She didn't object. She had gotten very close with Mito and Narumi. Tsunade always wanted a daughter, and Mito and Naru were as close to one as she would get. She was also fond of Menma because of how much he reminded her of Nawaki, her little brother. Menma was always yelling about how he would be the best Hokage ever and make his parents proud. She couldn't help but like the kid and have the desire to keep him and his sisters safe. Kushina and Minato were torn between what they believed was the fate of the world and their own family. They knew that if they went through with Jiraiya's plan it was likely Naruto would cut ties with them. It pained them to see their son alone, only making it worse when he would inquire about his treatment. Minato always tried to let him down easily, his mother and godparents were rather blunt. Kushina hated herself for putting her son through this, but at the end of the day, if she had to forsake one person to save the world, she knew she had to do it. It would be selfish and irresponsible for her not to do everything she could to ensure the peace her, Minato. Jiraiya and Tsunade have always wanted. She put all her hope into explaining it to Naruto one day. She knew that her son would understand and not hold any hostilities towards her and would even agree with her methods, or so she thought. Tsunade never was fond of Naruto. She wasn't around for the first year he was alive, arriving just a week before the Nine Tails attacked the village to help with Kushina's delivery. She just never got close to him, nor did she really try. She of course was busy, but would put time aside for Mito, Narumi, and Menma. When she looked at Mito she saw her surrogate daughter Kushina and when she looked at Menma she instantly saw Nawaki. Narumi was so kind and gentle, she would instantly melt away Tsunade's hard exterior. The joy that swept through her when she was with the triplets was exactly what she always wanted. Naruto was never given the same privilege. She just never really was interested in him. She couldn't explain why, but she had brushed him off for years. The thought of it sickened her, but she always remembered the prophecy of the Toad Sage. The day of Nawaki's death she vowed that she would put an end to the senseless violence of the shinobi world. She now had her chance to mold the ones that could bring about the long sought after peace. She wouldn't waste this opportunity. Jiraiya was upset. No, he was livid. He never had a family, being a war orphan. His first friends were Tsunade and Orochimaru and there was a time where he would do anything for them. When Orochimaru betrayed the village, Jiraiya took it personally. He failed to save his friend. He failed to protect the village. He became the one thing he hated most, a failure. When he got the summons from the Toad Sage and heard the prophecy, his life was given a new purpose. He had always wanted to bring about peace to the world so nobody ever had to go through what he did. He may have failed in the past, but this was something he could not mess up. The fact that those he chose to involve didn't seem as committed to ensuring a lasting peace angered him to no end. He was done keeping his thoughts to himself. You are being irrational. Your entire family has the burden to carry, being the family of the Hokage. Mito, Narumi, and Menma upheld their duty the day they were born. They saved the entire goddamn village for fuck's sake. Every word he spoke was true. Minato looked up to see his sensei with his palms at the other end of his desk, looking directly at Minato. Naruto has nothing to do with this. His burden to carry is nothing compared to that of the triplets. It is your job to do your part. The entire world relies on one of the triplets. We can't allow one kid to be the downfall of the entire world. He has no part in this and should be treated as such. He is nothing. Jiraiya's last words echoed for some time. Nobody really noticed how long they stood in silence, but the silence was interrupted by a calm Jiraiya. You must understand, the world is in our hands. We can't put ourselves over the fate of our world. I'm sorry, but I won't forsake the world for one breath. Jiraiya then turned to leave the room but was stopped by Minato calling out to him. I understand Sensei. We know what must be done. I just hope Naruto will forgive us when the time comes. He added in his head. As they filed out of the office, they didn't realize a small blonde boy sitting behind one of the open double doors. Um nothing, Naruto mumbled over and over again as tears fell silently down his face. Flashback end. Scene change, Naruto and Ace's home, Land of Iron. Naruto grit his teeth just thinking about his family again. 
he knew that when it was time for him to become a shinobi, he would have to return home, but he hated the idea of it. It made him feel sick with anger. He had made a promise to Ace that he would give his family a chance when the time came, but Naruto knew he would have little patience for them. Naruto was interrupted from his musings when he heard Ace say something. What? I didn't hear you, Naruto responded, trying to find his brother figure. Ace slowly made his way out of the shadows and walked towards Naruto, who was still chained in the center of the room. Ace was wearing a different cloak today. Rather than his usual divine, gold cloak, he now wore a cloak of similar design, except the color scheme was swapped. The vast majority of the cloak was black, with white trimmings, symbol, and accents. That wasn't the most startling thing though. When Naruto met Ace's eyes, he felt a chill run down his spine. He no longer had the warm golden eyes Naruto had gotten used to. Instead, his eyes were replaced with his oculus form. I said happy birthday, Naruto. His voice sounded slightly on edge, which made Naruto tense. Is there any reason as to why you have me chained? Don't tell me you have some sort of bondage kink, Ace, Naruto said with a mischievous grin. Ace caught off guard by the joke, erupted into a fit of laughter. They both laughed for about 15 seconds before Ace gathered himself. Naruto, usually I give you some sort of weapon for your birthday present, Ace said in the tone Naruto was used to, smooth and comforting. Well up until now. You have only had access to half of your true power. For your birthday present, I'm going to unlock the second half of your power. Naruto's face lit up. He had been training his ass off for the past years in order to get strong. He wanted to be able to protect those precious to him, which for the moment was only Ace. He hoped to find a nice girl later in life and start a family, but it was hard for him to make friends. He spent a majority of his time training with Ace, but would also go and mingle with the citizens they came across during their travels. He would oftentimes hear stories about the prince and princesses of the leaf. He would hear the rumors about him. I heard he attacked his family on his sibling's birthday. I wonder what the Hokage would do to that little monster. He's not a monster. He's just the failure of the leaf. He is the disappointment. He will never be anything else. Naruto knew exactly where these names came from. All those years ago, when his family stripped him of his birthright in front of all the important villager and shinobi, it was the same as saying that he wasn't worthy of carrying on their family name. If his own parents didn't see him as good enough, how could he expect the simple-minded villagers to see him any differently? He was always insulted as a kid. Mainly by Sakura Hirano and Kiba Inuzuka, sometimes Manma would also jump in. Naruto planned on returning to the Leaf the year his siblings would be graduating and he would hope that he wasn't placed on a team with anyone that he couldn't stand. When it came to Manma, he idolized Jiraiya. He loved everything about him, even started to take after his perverted tendencies. He started to copy Jiraiya including how he treated Naruto. To put I simply, it was antagonistic. Jiraiya saw Naruto as the reason Minato and Kushina might forsake the world. He would snap at him, yell at him, send him away, and even go as far as to insult Naruto. He always heard from Jiraiya that it would be hard to put Naruto aside, but that he had to do it, for the sake of the world. Menma took those words to heart, nobody knew the truth. They didn't know that at the age of 10, Naruto could take on any Jonin in the village. They were too blind. They were foolish, and they deserved to pay. For some reason, when he was at his lowest points, he would hear a voice in his head telling him to kill them all. The voice's favorite line was, they don't deserve your mercy. To an extent, Naruto agreed with the voice. While he knew that eventually he would be able to fight and defeat his parents and godparents, but the voice seemed to strengthen Naruto. It made him feel like he could fight the Sanin, Yellow Flash, and Red Death. Ace would oftentimes calm him down. But the voice never went away entirely. It's been harder to control your emotions, recently hasn't it? Ace asked, as if he were reading Naruto's mind. The look on Naruto's face told Ace all he needed to know. Let me tell you a little about the half of your power that is still sealed. Ace pulled his hand from his side and a portion of the stone floor shifted upwards, allowing Ace to sit casually on it. Much like Chakra has a yin and yang, your power has a light and a dark. Ace then started to release his power, a golden and black aura. The ground around Ace shattered at the slightest release of his power. Naruto was always amazed at the density of Ace's power. Ace made the air feel like it became a solid object whenever he released his power. Naruto was a glad that the chains were holding him up because if they weren't, just standing would have been taxing. The gold in my power is the light side. It is what I have been training you to use. This energy focuses on the happy emotions you feel and naturally limits you because of that. The gold energy is called aura. The black energy consists of all the negative emotions and memories I hold. The black energy is called killing intent. Key is much harder to use, because in order to master it, 
you have to accept all of the bad things that have happened to you over the years. This power is only obtainable to the highest caliber legion, Ace stopped channeling his aura slash key but continued to restrain Naruto. He pulled up a chair next to Naruto. Ace rose from his seat and put his hand on top of Naruto's head. I think you are ready to conquer these demons. You are going to lift the limit yourself, so on the count of three, I am going to break down the natural barriers your mind had put up. It is going to be a struggle and will likely take a few days. I'm going to restrict you the entire time, not for my safety, but for your own. This power will throw off the balance you have obtained over the past five years, but if you can master this power along with your aura, you would be the greatest force the elemental nations has ever seen. Ace ruffled Naruto's hair a bit then began to channel some key into his hand. Prepare yourself, Naruto. 1. 2. THR Naruto only heard half of the last word before he was pulled into his mind. Naruto opened his eyes to see a plain white room about the size of a football field. He walked towards the center where he saw a figure sitting alone in the darkness. The only source of light in the room was what seemed like a lone spotlight that was directly above Naruto. He approached the figure and was shocked when he got a good look at the figure. The figure was an exact replica of him with a few key changes. For one, the figure's eyes were solid black, jet black hair, and weird black markings running up and down his body, like Akame's during her fight with Estith and Akame ga kill. The figure wore a simple black shirt and white shorts, like Kaneki when he fought Jason in Tokyo Ghoul. He looked up and made eye contact with Naruto. The movement their eyes met Naruto saw all the hardships he has had in his life. He saw the times his parents and godparents yelled at him for no reason. He saw the times he was pushed aside for his younger siblings. He relived every excruciating detail of those encounters and felt the pain of depression he had fought before he met Ace. This time through things felt so much worse. Every new memory he remembered exactly, but hoped that the endings would change. He wished for his parents' acceptance, still to this day. Then he felt a shift. The Naruto in front of him got up and started walking towards Naruto. The tears on his face dried up as his eyes shifted to a burning rage. Naruto was unsure of what to do until he heard the voice that had been plaguing him for the past few months. Kill them all. Spare no one. Train, gather strength, then when the time comes, kill everyone who has wronged you. The voice was so sinister that it would make a cage break into a cold sweat. But to Naruto it seemed welcoming. The voice made Naruto feel a sense of purpose unlike anything he had previously experienced. He understood the figure in front of him. Hell, he agreed with it. His family had no right to mistreat him like this. He was done accepting it. He wouldn't lay down and be everyone's bitch anymore. It was about time he did something about the pain that constantly plagued him. A grin etched itself on Naruto's face as he reached for the figure's outstretched hand. Right as he was about to contact the other Naruto's hand, Ace flashed in his mind. Not just Ace, but all the time they had spent together. The times Ace would crack jokes and they would laugh until their stomachs hurt. The times Ace listened to Naruto and comforted him. The times Naruto cried into Ace's chest after he was reminded of how little his family cared about him. The times Ace snuck Naruto through villages and towns so Naruto's location wasn't discovered. The times Ace went out to eat with Naruto to celebrate his accomplishments. Everything, the good times, the bad times, all of it. Naruto remembered how much Ace had done for him and came to a decision. Rather than grabbing the figure's extended hand, Naruto pulled his counterpart into a warm embrace that made the embodiment of darkness stiffen. Naruto then spoke, instantly feeling himself calm down. It's okay, we aren't alone anymore. We have Ace. They don't matter anymore. The figure sat in shock for a moment before slowly returned the embrace as tears began to run down both of their cheeks. We can dislike them, we can even hate them. Something Ace used to say echoed in his head, the worst type of violence is unnecessary violence. We don't need them to be happy. At this point, both the figure and Naruto were beginning to fade. They then began to merge into one as Naruto's vision went black. When he awoke, he was lying flat on his back on a small bed, with a wet towel on his head. Naruto tried to stand up, but as he rose from the bed his legs gave out from under him. Ace appeared out of nowhere and caught him before he became acquainted with the stone floor. Naruto looked up and saw Ace had a massive smile on his face. You did it Naruto. You have accepted your demons, but didn't let them devour you. You will now be able to train and utilize some your key without losing control. Eventually you will be able to utilize it completely, but it will take years for you to master key. Naruto matched Ace's smile with one of his own, then closed his eyes and let unconsciousness claim him. Flashback, a few months before Naruto's 13th birthday. Scene change, land of demons. Naruto had been training in key usage for a few months but was having trouble. Ace had taken Naruto to the land of demons on purpose. Few people lived in the country 
so Ace thought it would be a good place to train some of the more destructive parts of their power. Naruto seemed increasingly determined to master his power. He was making rapid progress, much to Ace's delight. Time skip, Naruto's 13th birthday. For Naruto's birthday, Ace had given him something similar to a summoning contract. Ace was partnered with the King of the Dragons, Rayquaza. Rayquaza was a massive 125 feet long, and towering over Ace and Naruto. After some convincing, Ray agreed to help Naruto find a partner within his ranks. It was not going very well. Naruto plopped down on the ground with an exaggerated sigh. He had conversed with at least a dozen dragons, but their compatibility never seemed to be optimal. He was about to call it a day when Ray spoke up. Listen child, this next dragon is my eldest son. His name is Drogon, yes, the one from Game of Thrones. He has never been the kindest creature, but he is extremely powerful and loyal. Just be wary, his respect is not easy to gain, King Ray warned the blonde. In a flash of white hot fire, a giant black orange dragon appeared in front of Naruto. The figure was easily bigger than the chief Dode game Abunta. On his hind legs, Drogon stood about 90 feet tall and his scale were sharp like blades. Around his head were long protruding spikes that were each about a foot long. His presence was crushing, taking Naruto a few moments to adjust. Drogon looked around and then he saw Ace. Ah! Ace, did you finally decide to ditch the old geezer and partner with someone from the next generation? I've been waiting for you to call me you know. You're the only human that has ever bested me in a fight, Drogon said as he aimed a cheeky grin at his father. The Golden Green King was about to retort when Ace beat him to it. My memory must be failing me, but the last time you Ray fought, I could have sworn you only lasted five minutes, Ace grinned as he acted like he was trying to remember something. His grin grew when he heard a low growl coming from Drogon, Ray cleared his voice, gathering everyone's attention. Actually Drogon, I called you here to see if you would like to partner with Ace's apprentice, Drogon looked genuinely interested now. Anybody that his father and Ace approved of must truly be a force to be reckoned with. Drogon looked around to find the apprentice his father spoke of but only found a small child staring back at him. This little shit is really your apprentice ace? Drogon questioned with unmasked confusion. Yes, I actually consider him a little brother more than I do an apprentice. I can tell you're not impressed, but I would like to inform you that Naruto, who turned 13 today, has already been training in key usage for a year, Ace said with a sense of pride that was reserved strictly for himself and those close to him. Drogon's eyes widened a tad as he turned his gaze back to the blonde. He lowered his head until he was eye level with child, then a thought crossed his mind. Naruto sensing something was wrong calmed himself and started to prepare for whatever might happen next. As he expected, Drogon released a roar that shook the very earth to its core. He held his roar for about 10 seconds then ended with a nice snap that was mere inches away from Naruto's face. Naruto, expecting some sort of test. Didn't even flinch. He stared at the dragon in front of him and spoke nonchalantly. You apparently don't know much about dental hygiene. Drogon grinned in response and turned back to his father and Ace. I like him. Flashback end. Over the years, Drogon and Naruto grew very close. Ace had them train together frequently which helped with their teamwork and allowed their friendship flourish. Naruto and Drogon had more of a sibling relationship now, built on mutual respect and lots of banner. Ace loved when the two went at each other because they came up with amazing insults. The best part about their relationship was no matter how harsh the insults were, there were never any hard feelings between the two. The verbal spars allowed them to constantly battle with each other but not have to deal with any physical injuries. Needless to say, both parties enjoyed the arrangement. On Naruto's 14th birthday, Ace did something much simpler. He gave Naruto a wristband that would expand over the length of his forearm. On the front was a screen that allowed Naruto to easily manage the many restrictor seals that Ace had placed on him. The wristband could also be used to contact Ace or Drogon at any time and had any feature Naruto could want. It has all the features an iPhone like, maps, notes, calendar, etc. The idea behind it amazed Naruto. He never even imagined that technology could progress this far, but he gratefully accepted it. Naruto had come to use this for everything. He would take pictures of his family's scrolls with it write down personal notes in it, and basically use it to make his life easier. They spent Naruto's last two birthdays traveling to specific places Naruto wanted to. The first place he wanted to go to was the village hidden in the mist. Naruto wanted to see the horrors of war firsthand and help as many people as possible. They spent a month in the land of water, traveling from island to island helping evacuate civilians, healing the injured, and even fighting on more than one occasion. Naruto wanted to fight for the revolution. But Ace said that their location would be discovered if stories about a blonde 15-year-old started spreading to the leaf. He promised Naruto that he would return to the hidden mist and that they would fight for the revolution. 
Ace and Naruto got to know the leader of the rebellion, Meitimuru. She took quite a liking to Ace, oftentimes flirting with him and trying to seduce him. Naruto couldn't help but notice her beauty. She was in her early 20s, had long, auburn hair, and had a beautiful figure that many of her underlings gawked at. Naruto was surprised when Ace would flirt back with her, but then deny her advances. When he asked Ace, he told Naruto that he wouldn't sleep with her then leave to complete Naruto's training. He had too much respect for Mei and hoped to teach Naruto a thing or two about dealing with the fairer sex. Naruto understood Ace's worries and Mei respected his decision, or at least she did when he promised to return when Naruto had finished his training. While they were there, Naruto notched his first few kills. They were a group of bandits that were raiding a refugee camp that got separated from the main group during a raid on the military base. He killed them quickly, two with his bare hands, three with his knives, one with ninjutsu and five with his staff. Naruto's body moved on its own. He saw the attacks like they were coming in slow motion. Each kill was perfectly executed. No excess movements or missed strikes. As he stood over his fallen foes, Naruto expected to feel sadness or pity for those he killed. He felt nothing of the sort. He noticed Ace walking up and seeing the mess he made. Ace stayed silent for a second, analyzing everything he could from Naruto. Naruto took it as an invitation to speak. I'm glad we came here. I needed to see this, Naruto's words were dead silent. He had seen mass murder, rape, theft, and abduction on an enormous scale. He was warned by Ace, but even his words didn't capture the horrors they had seen. It's time to get going, Ace's words were soft, allowing Naruto a moment if he needed one. To his surprise, Naruto just nodded and followed him out of the camp. Ace was shocked at how well Naruto took his first kill. Naruto, are you sure you're okay? Ace stopped and looked right at his little brother for a moment. Naruto looked up, making eye contact with the Legion. You always told me, we must be the change we want to see in the world. Well the world I hope to create, a world of peace and prosperity is worth the struggle for me. Naruto looked back at the bodies one last time, they may have been the first to fall by my hand, but they won't be the last. Present time, approaching the gates of the Hidden Leaf, Naruto couldn't help but think about the past year. He spent the year traveling all over the Land of Fire, getting acquainted with people and studying the layout of the land. He trained harder in the past year than he ever had before, reaching a level he was certain few others had. His power had grown immensely over the years. He had fully mastered teleportation, and was more than happy with his skills in telepathy and telekinesis. Naruto spent a lot of time training with Ki still, getting as comfortable with it as possible. He had a firm handle on it for the most part, but oftentimes got sloppy when using it for extended periods of time. He really leaned on Ace to push him through some of the rougher times, which Ace happily did. Naruto's regeneration was a thing of wonder. He could regrow entire limbs within a minute now, he was also growing more accustomed to the pain of regenerating, making him achieve a pain tolerance that sometimes startled Ace. Ninjutsu-wise, Naruto had mastered individual elemental jutsu for fire and wind. He was particularly proficient in water as well, not quite achieving the level of the second Hokage, but it was definitely a goal Naruto had. He had mastered many lightning-style jutsu as well as earth but the thing that he was proudest of were the Kake Genkai. Though he didn't have it in his blood, Naruto was able to use ice, lava, and scorch style to a level that demanded respect. Naruto was always very secretive with his usage of wood style, only training as far away from cities and towns as possible. He knew that the wood style was the most sought after Kake Genkai in the world, and if there was even a rumor of someone using it, he would have all of the hidden villages searching for him. When it came to his proficiency in the wood style, it was hard to judge. The reason the wood style was so powerful was for its ability to suppress and even tame the tailed beasts. Naruto hadn't gotten the opportunity to face a Jin Shuriki yet, but even if his wood style wasn't enough, he was more than confident in his other abilities. Whenever he trained in the wood style, the destruction to his training ground was ridiculous, but that wasn't exactly a surprise to him, considering the fact that it rips up the ground to summon the wood. If Naruto had to estimate his capabilities in comparison to the first, he would say somewhere around two-thirds of what the Hashirama was capable of. Naruto was pulled from his thoughts when Ace smacked him in the side of the head. Ow! What the fuck, Ace? Naruto barked, slightly agitated by the aching he felt in the right side of his head. Ace wore a cheeky grin as he held a hand out. I couldn't get your attention. By the way, you lost the bet. Ace's grin grew into a smirk. Naruto's eyes widened for a moment as he opened his mouth to protest, but immediately closed it, instead reaching into his pocket to grab out 10,000 Rio and handed it to Ace, who gladly pocketed the bill. Ace looked at his brother as they closed in on the grand gates that let you into the hidden leaf. So, you were thinking about them again, huh? 
Ace's words made Naruto flinch a bit. All the progress Naruto had made during their 11 years of training and traveling, but Naruto seemed scared to come back to the leaf. The only response Ace got was a stiff nod from the blonde. There's nothing we can do about it now, so stop worrying. Ace rested his hands in his pockets as they were now only a few feet from the entrance to the village. We just have to follow the plan and let the chips fall as they may, Naruto said as they walked through the gate. Chapter 3, Home Sweet Home Ace and Naruto walked through the gate slowly, taking in the scene around them. The leaf hadn't changed that much since Naruto had been gone. The buildings were still modest. The roads were still crowded with merchants, civilians, and shinobi-like. Naruto couldn't help but smile at the scene. Sure. He hated the people here, but the idea of people living together in a state of relative peace was what the first Hokage fought so hard for. Naruto respected the first more than anybody, minus Ace. Naruto wanted to bring the peace to the world and ensure that the horrors he saw in the hidden mist were ended. He was smart enough to know that what he wanted wouldn't come easy. For a century, the five major villages have waged wars against one another. Many had lost loved ones at the hands of enemy shinobi, and those feelings don't just disappear. Naruto knew he would have his work cut out for him, but he was willing to dirty his hands. Lives would have to be taken for him to achieve his goal, and he was more than willing to do it himself. Naruto looked up at the great stone faces, gritting his teeth when he got to his father's. They were heading to see him now, Ace had convinced him that it would be better to deal with things now. Naruto took a few more step when he was stopped by Izumo Kamazuki and Kotetsu Hagane. The two were responsible for guarding the entrance. The Chunin walked up to Ace and Naruto. Curious about the blonde that had just walked past them. Izumo's eyes widened for a moment before a stunned Kotetsu spoke. And Naruto. Is that you? Kotetsu's voice below even a whisper. Izumo tried to speak, but was unable to. The lost son of the Hokage had just walked through their gate after 11 years of having the best tracking ninja search for him. Naruto's face was a so painfully similar to Minato's. It was like the Hokage himself was staring them down. The shifted uncomfortably after Naruto did not reply. Before they could speak again, Naruto looked up, making eye contact with them. I don't wish to be disturbed. Go sit down and tell no one you saw me. Naruto's voice was deathly calm as he used his telepathy to control the two. He watched as the color in Kotetsu and Izumo's eyes faded and the nodded silently. They then got out of his way and went to sit back down at their booth by the entrance. Ace turned to Naruto, who was covering his hair with a hood. He gave Naruto a questioning look that didn't go unnoticed by the blonde. If we are doing this, then we are doing it on our terms, Naruto's words stern and reinforcing. Ace gave a firm nod as he put his hood up too. They made their way through the village, the Hokage Tower their destination. Perception change, Mito. It was a beautiful day. The sun was high in the cloudless sky and the birds were singing their beautiful songs. Mito lied in her bed by the window looking up at the sky. She had graduated just yesterday and was on break for a week while the Janan teams were decided. Her parents were both busy setting up the teams and gave her, Menma and Narumi the day off. Mito had grown up into a young heartthrob. She now stood at 5 feet, 4 inches tall and had her mother's red hair running down to her waist when it wasn't up in a ponytail. Her body was very toned from all of her training, giving her a desirable flat stomach and stunning, toned legs. He womanly features had developed over the years as well. Mito had a 34C, bra size and was often ogled by some of her classmates. She wasn't lacking downstairs either. She truly got her mother's figure as her butt was another point of interest for the boys, and some girls, in her class. Her model-like body was often hidden behind baggy clothes. She didn't actively seek recognition for her looks. Instead, she wanted to be praised when she earned it. Mito was currently wearing a plain white t-shirt and green gym shorts, her luscious red hair set free. As she lied on her bed looking out the window, her mind began to wander. It was on slow days like today that Mito's mind drifted towards Naruto. No matter how much she tried to hate him, no matter how much she wished he would just be found dead somewhere, she would instantly regret having those thoughts and fall into a pit of self-loathing. Mito was by far the smartest of the triplets. Her father was always praising her analytical skills, comparing her eye for detail to the Sharingan. She laughed at the thought. No matter how attentive she was, she could never hold a candle to the Uchiha's bloodline. She was the first to realize why Naruto left. The more and more she thought about it the clearer it became. She remembered all the happy times with Naruto. The jokes, pranks, stories, and tickle sessions that would make her smile for days on end. She never saw the other part of Naruto. It took Naruto leaving for Mito to finally notice the gap between him and their parents. She thought back to any time the family was together. It was always one of the triplets that chose where to eat, what toy to get, 
or what they were going to do. Every time Naruto suggested an idea, he was ignored or rejected. She hardly remembered the times Naruto tried to share his opinion. Instead she remembered years of Naruto staying quiet. He would rather go along with everything than go through the pain of continuous rejection. It wasn't just small things either. Mito remembered when Naruto turned 5 and asked to begin his shinobi training. He asked as nicely as Mito had ever heard. She can't recall a time when her, Narumi, or Menma were ever that respectful and humble when making a request. It's not like that changed the outcome. Naruto was rejected like always, his parents coming up with excuse after excuse each time Naruto asked for help. She never understood why until recently. Flashback, two years ago, Mito was up late studying for her exam over the second great ninja war, when she heard yelling coming from downstairs. Following the sound, she saw the doors open to her father's office, Jiraiya, Tsunade and her parents in a heated discussion. It's been nine years. If he hasn't been found dead yet, he likely found out how to take care of himself, Jiraiya said looking right at Kushina and Tsunade. The two women seemed ready to slap him, but Minato spoke before they got the chance. Sensei. My son is out there, by himself. He left because he felt like he wasn't loved. How can you stand there and not care about his well-being? Minato spat. Don't you fucking say that. Jiraiya shrieked as he slammed his fist on the wall, cracking many parts of it. It's my fault this happened. I was the one that brought you the prophecy all those years ago. I should have had faith in you like I always have. A lone tear ran down Jiraiya's cheek, shocking Mito. She had never seen Jiraiya cry other than when he was called a pervert or rejected by women. I still remember the day you told me you were going to name him after my character. Silent tears now ran down his face as he played the moment over again in his mind. It's the proudest I've ever been. When I got to hold him for the first time, I knew it was my job to protect him from harm and help him realize his goals in any way I can. Jiraiya wiped away some tears as he donned a sad smile. I was the one that pushed him away. This is all my fault. Tsunade tried to stop him. But Jiraiya was now starting at the last picture of Naruto in the house. One of Naruto in his mother's arms, with his father to the right and Jiraiya grinning like an idiot to the left. I fucked up. I fucked up beyond fixing, and I'm sorry for dragging you all down with me. Jiraiya tried his hardest to keep it together, clenching his fists so hard he drew blood. I know I don't deserve to see him again. But if I could just talk to him. I need to tell him it's my fault. This whole thing is my fault. I got you all worried about the damn prophecy and look and what that did. Jiraiya looked down at his hands as he opened his palms. Blood dripped onto the floor along with the tears that fell from Jiraiya's face. His gaze never left his hands as he clenched his fists one last time. I just don't know what to do. We have had the best trackers known to man looking for him for the past 11 years and they have barely gotten more than rumors and possible sightings. He doesn't want to see us again. And it's all my fault. Jiraiya walked back to a seat in the corner of the room. He slouched deep in the seat, letting out silent sobs as his regret and misery took center stage. It wasn't just you, a teary-eyed Kushina said as she leaned against the wall. It was me. Kushina's words were so faint Mito could barely hear them. I was worse than all of you. I'm an Uzumaki. Family is supposed to come before anything else, and I turned my back on my own child. Tears flowed freely down Kushina's features as she tried to continue. I failed as a mother. I failed as an Uzumaki. I deserve this. I deserve misery and pain and anguish. Mito saw her mom collapse to the ground, still holding the picture of Naruto from the desk. She saw her father go to comfort her mother, but nothing seemed to be working. Mito listened to her talk about Naruto. She could barely make out what she was saying through the sobs that racked her figure. Tsunade blamed herself for the missing child as well. She spent many nights drinking, trying to forget. But this was another life she had lost. She wondered if losing Dan and Nawaki was a form of prior punishment from an all-knowing god. As Tsunade finished up, Mito watched them all sit in silence. After a few moments, they made for the exit, making Mito scramble into a hiding spot. She waited there for a few moments until she thought everyone had left. She slowly climbed out from behind a potted plant in the corner, only to hear nearly silent sobbing coming from her father's office. She turned to see her father bawling his eyes out as he started at the picture of Naruto. She could almost feel the pain he did as she noticed the tears beginning to form in her eyes. She ran to her room as fast as she could and cried herself to sleep that night. Flashback end. Mito rolled over, hugging her pillow tight as she thought about her brother. She remembered Naruto's infectious laugh and brilliant smile. She didn't see much of either one in the last year he was there. She was pulled from her thoughts as she heard Narumi open the door. Nei-chan, get dressed. Tochan wants to see us in the Hokage office as soon as possible, Narumi said in her usual bubbly tone. Mita looked at her sister for a moment. Narumi was your textbook definition of a bombshell. 
Her slender figure was the fantasy of many, her 36 zebra size was filled out by her well-developed chest. Her blonde hair was pulled into her usual pigtails that went a little past the shoulder. She wore a mesh undershirt that she showed a tad because of her unzipped white and grey namikaze jacket she was wearing over it. She wore grey anbu pants and had medical tape around her left thigh. She was two inches shorter than her older sister, but Narumi was much more outgoing. She oftentimes kept the attention off of Mito. Mito gave a grunt in response and got up to get ready. What the hell does Tochan want? Scene change, Hokage office, a few minutes prior. Minato, Jiraiya, Kushina, and Tsunade were all working diligently. They were planning out the Janan teams and had hit quite the wall. Kushina had proposed the idea of being the Jonin for the triplets team a few months back, which was pretty well received. She had gotten stronger over the years of training the triplets, and she also was able to restrain them if the Nine Tails were to take over. Minato hated this part of his job. Every detail had to be taken into account. If he made a wrong choice now, a team could fail, or worse, die. He had been at it for six hours so far. It was time for a break. He looked up from the file he was looking at and leaned back in his chair. He took a deep breath and watched those around him work for a moment. Next to Minato was Kushina, sitting on the floor looking over the files of a potential team. Minato took a moment to admire his wife's beauty. The years had done little to drag her down, not looking a day over thirty. He was in a very similar state. He hadn't changed much over the years, but the occasional grey strand could be seen in his mop of yellow. For his first years in office, Minato relied heavily on the guidance of the previous Hokage, Hiruzen. When Hiruzen died fighting the Nine Tails, Minato became much more stressed. Not only did he have three more kids at home that just happened to be Jin Shuriki, but he lost the wise advice of the professor. Minato looked to his left and saw Tsunade sitting across from Jiraiya. Tsunade was sifting through applicants for her medical ninjutsu program, while Jiraiya was going through Menma, Mito and Narumi's files, apparently looking for something. Minato was about to get up when he heard a knock at the door. Shizun opened the door in a panicked hurry. She immediately got everyone's attention, Minato being the first to address her. What's wrong Shizun? We weren't to be bothered unless it's dire. Minato seemed more concerned than angry as Shizun tried to calm herself. A man showed up and said he had information on Naruto. Shizun's words stopped everything in the room. It had been years since they had anything received anything usable in the search for Naruto. The most they got were whispers and far-fetched rumors. As much as he wanted to send the man away, Minato couldn't bring himself to do it. What if this was the lead they needed to finally find him? They could at least spare a few minutes to hear this person out. Minato gave a slight nod as everyone cleaned up the office a bit. Tsunade, Kushina, and Jiraiya stood behind him while her remained in his seat behind his desk. A few moments later, Shizun walked in with two men. The first was a bit taller than the other. He had short brown hair that was a bit shaggy on top. His face was void of any fat, as were his exposed arms. His arms had a few major scars snaking around, but the man's face was clean. He had brilliant golden eyes that immediately caught everyone's attention. The man wore a black cloak with golden detailing. The cloak was so dark. It seemed to suck in a light around it. Under the cloak the man wore a dark grey, skin-tight muscle shirt that clung to the man's figure. His legs were covered by black sweatpants and his feet with black combat boots. To Minato, the man looked suspicious. He wore a smirk that put everyone on edge and carried his weapons into the meeting. Minato tensed a bit as the man walked forward, his smirk turning into an oddly warm smile. I'm Ace, thank you for taking the time out of your day to see me. Ace's smile barely dropped as he eyed everyone in the room. Kushina was giving him a hard look, like Ace expected. Minato, despite hoping for the best, was still wearing his professional neutral expression. Jiraiya was more optimistic for the meeting, as was Tsunade. No one had come forth with information about Naruto like this in years. The times they did a face-to-face -face meetings with someone, they usually got a decent tip, or a reliable sighting. Believe it or not. Not many people wanted to get in front of 4S class shinobi and waste their time. Eyes shifted to the other cloaked figure standing behind Ace. The figure was completely concealed, but didn't set off any alarm seals as he walked in the room, so he mustn't be carrying any weapons other than the ones on his back, two swords just like Ace. The figure didn't speak, but all the experienced shinobi in the room could tell that figure was tense. He was giving out an unstable presence that put everyone on high alert. They could only see he bottom of his face, which didn't exactly give away his identity. They were ready for a fight at a moment's notice, but their thoughts were interrupted by Ace, who cleared his throat. So, like I'm sure your assistant told you, I came to talk about Naruto. Everyone before Ace flinched at the mention of the boy. Ace could see guilt rush over them like a tsunami. Yes, Minato said, his cold blue eyes hardening, 
and make sure this is worth our time, this is not an issue we take lightly. Minato noticed the slightest of shifts in the figure behind Ace. Kushina noticed it as well, but the Sunin focused on Ace. Ace took a step forward, his smirk never leaving. It's been around 11 years, hasn't it? Ace's question only merited a stern nod from Minato, while Jiraiya, Tsunade, and Kushina seemed to prickle at Ace's tone. Ace took another step forward, only a foot or two from the desk, I've heard about his departure, but I wanted to hear it from you all. What happened? Kushina snapped. The smirk on Ace's face made her blood boil. She hated when people wasted their time, especially when it came to Naruto, and from the looks of it, this asshat just wanted to piss them off. She clenched her fists and spoke in an agitated tone. That's none of your business, now do you have anything worthwhile to say, or do you just plan on wasting our time? Kushina's agitation seemed to make Ace happy. His smirk grew as he let out a small chuckle. No need for hostility here. Your temper definitely live up to the stories, Red Death. I don't think I've ever pissed someone off that quickly before. Ace left his smile up, knowing it was getting under the skin of everyone present. Minato was about to send him out, when Ace spoke again. I mean, I've only heard his side of the story. I thought it would be unfair to not at least hear your side before I make any assumptions. Ace's words made their eyes shoot open. His smirk widened again. Kushina shot out from her spot behind the desk and grabbed Ace by the collar of his cloak. Where did you see him? Kushina had lost all sense of restraint as she let question fly one after another. Was he okay? Where was he heading? Ace couldn't help but let out another chuckle at Kushina. Ace took a breath as swiped her hands away, making everyone in the room get ready for a fight. Ace acted annoyed as he straightened out his cloak. He looked Kushina dead in the eye. I think your question should be asked to my partner here, not me. Ace's words stopped everyone for a moment. There was a second where his words sunk in, followed by all attention shifting to the cloaked figure standing about five feet behind Ace. As if in slow motion, Naruto pulled down his hood, revealing his mess of spiky blonde hair to his family. Everyone lost their breath as they started at Naruto. He donned a cold expression as his sea-blue eyes analyzed every detail of his family. Minato's eyes were wide as dinner plates as he shot out of his chair. He completely forgot about Ace for a moment as he tried to get around his desk. Jiraiya couldn't move. His mouth hung agape, his eyes wide. His knees became weak, barely able to hold his weight. Tsunade wasn't any better. Upon seeing her godson, she lost her breath. After all these years, all the failed attempts at locating the lost blonde, he just shows up. She stumbled forward, stabilizing herself with the couch closest to her. She let out a few tears as she started to mumble to herself no one paying attention to her. All focus was dedicated to Naruto, for the first time since the triplets came along. And Nar. Kushina began before she dashed towards Naruto, wanting nothing more than to hug her eldest and never let go. As she closed in, she saw Naruto's eyes shift to her. Her vision blurred as tears ran down her face. She could see nothing else but her son as the biggest smile imaginable dawned on her features. As she made the final lunge towards her son, he disappeared. Kushina was confused for a moment thinking it was some sort of joke, but she turned to see her son now standing by Ace's side, looking down at her in disgust. Tears overflowed as she collapsed to her knees. Everyone, minus Ace was shocked at his display, but they took a backseat to his reaction towards his mother. Ace's smirk fell as he turned back to Minato. He took in the reactions of the Sanin and Hokage, then Naruto spoke. Don't fucking touch me, Naruto's voice hardly more than a growl. Hate and anger oozed off of him as he stared at his mother. Minato stopped dead in his tracks. He didn't expect Naruto to be happy whenever they found him, but he also didn't expect this. The more he thought about it, they deserved nothing less. They were fools to think him coming home into their open arms was even remotely a possibility. The Sanin were in a daze. They expected Naruto to be angry, they expected him to want nothing to do with them, but watching him avoid his mother's attempted physical contact after over a decade of being gone made the reality ring home. Naruto's feelings towards them were abundantly clear and they had no idea what that meant. They knew this reaction was probable, but even expecting it did nothing to shield them from the pain they felt. Kushina stood there horrified. He knees felt weak, her breath choppy. She let out even more tears as she collapsed under the gaze of her oldest. He looked absolutely revolted by her attempt. In her head, she knew she deserved this, but for those few moments she saw him, she allowed herself the slightest spark of hope only for it to be smashed by the reality. She lost it and continued to cry in her heap on the ground. Naruto looked down at her with cold eyes for a moment before he spoke. What you are feeling right now doesn't even compare to what you all put me through. Naruto's words cut deeper than any blade could. He felt the sadness coming from his mother, but wasn't affected by it. 
he took a step forward, so he would be even with Ace and faced his father. Call the triplets, I'm not saying this twice. Time skip, a few minutes. With the triplets, Mito was conflicted. She wanted to enjoy her day off, but she didn't actually have anything to do. She didn't know what to expect from her father's summons. She assumed it was something to do with the upcoming team assignments, but she had a weird feeling about the meeting. As her, Menma, and Narumi walked down the street, countless civilians and shinobi came up to them, congratulating them for passing the Janan exam. Mito and Narumi were very humble, kindly replying to everyone. Menma was a different story. Menma started off very humble, thanking anyone that congratulated him. After the first dozen or so, he grew rather annoyed. He knew the Janan exam was a joke among the higher-level shinobi. The civilian council had pushed to lower the standards for years, and to say they accomplished their goal would be putting it lightly. They made it to where it was almost impossible to fail the damn thing. The only ones that came out of the academy that were worth a damn thing were those that came from a shinobi family. Menma knew that the villagers were just trying to kiss his ass and eventually started blowing off their praise. Menma had grown a lot over the years. He now stood at a solid 5 feet, 8 inches tall. He had a slender figure like his father and the same messy blonde hair. He wore an old chunin vest he found in the attic and a long sleeve blue undershirt. On his legs were a pair of navy blue pants and his usual shinobi sandals. The most notable thing Menma wore was a cloak that had future Hokage printed vertically down his spine. He modeled the cloak after his father's, except the color of the detailing was blue. Menma received a lot of attention from the girls in his class, whether it was for his looks, skill, or the fact that he was the son of the Hokage. He wasn't sure. Menma looked over at his older sister. Mito was in her civilian clothes, a red hoodie with the Uzumaki swirl on the center, black sweatpants, and a pair of tennis shoes. She had her hair tied back in a ponytail like normal, but she still was very pretty. The way the guys would talk about Mito and Narumi bothered Menma. They would often let their gazes linger on his sisters for a little longer than Menma was comfortable with, and always talk about their appearances in lewd ways. Menma had beaten up more than one fool that tried to get handsy with his sisters, as if they needed the protection. The three siblings finally made it to the way up the stairs to their father's office. Outside the door was a very rattled Shizun, who didn't seem to notice them. They tried to talk to her, but she seemed lost in her own world. Not being able to get her attention, they all shared a shrug and walked in the office. Mito couldn't shake the feeling that something bad was about to happen. Scene change, inside the Hokage office. The room was silent after Minato ordered the Anbu to go find his kids. A few attempts at conversation were made, none of which were accepted by the eldest of the Namikaze Uzumaki children. Unsure of what to do, Kushina, Minato, and the Sanin just waited for the triplets to show up. Naruto and Ace were sitting across from each other on the couches previously occupied by the Sanin. Ace had his arms behind his head as he lounged out, his right foot up on the couch Naruto was sitting on. Naruto was sitting with his eyes closed and his arms crossed over his chest as he waited. After what felt like an eternity of painful silence, the door to the office opened up to show the rest of the Namikaze Uzumaki family. As the triplets walked in, it took them a moment to realize Naruto and Ace. They first noticed their still crying mother being comforted by their father and a very shaken pair of Sanin mumbling to themselves as if they were trying to calm themselves down. Narumi was the first one to glance to the side and see the mess of blonde hair. Her heart seemed to stop for a moment as she gasped for air. Her siblings noticed her reaction and followed her gaze. When they saw their brother sitting there facing them, they had very different reactions. Mito stopped as if someone hit her pause button. She didn't blink or even breath as she stared at Naruto. She quickly rubbed her eyes to make sure they weren't playing tricks on her. When she realized that it was in fact Naruto sitting there, her brain shut down. Everything she wanted to say, everything she wanted to do overwhelmed her. She went was both happy and angry. She was excited, yet worried. She couldn't gather herself as she just started to shake violently as her internal struggle went on. Menmo had a much different reaction. He saw his brother sitting there, like he would rather be any place in the world, and Menma immediately filled with anger. He grit his teeth and clenched his fists so hard his arms were shaking. He suddenly felt a surge of nine tails chakra flood into his system and he charged right at his brother's seated form. Menma moved too fast for anyone to react. All the adults could do was watch as Menma charged right at his brother, his right fist cocked back and ready to claim his brother's jaw. As Menma got closer to his brother, he heard his mother and sisters cry out for him to stop. He ignored them, his focus on making Naruto experience the pain Menma did when his brother left. In one swift movement, Naruto opened his eyes and parried Menma's punch then countered with a right hook to Menma's cheek that shook the entire room. Menma flew helplessly through the air until he crashed into the wall, next to the door. 
The force of the punch nearly sent Menma through the wall, but the protective barrier seals surrounding the office stopped him. The wall had cracks running all around the center of impact. Menma pulled himself out of the crater in the wall with a throaty growl and spat out a large sum of blood. He was about to charge Naruto again when his father appeared in between them and stopped his charge. Menma continued to push for a few moments, especially when he saw the bored expression his brother had on. Minato quickly tightened the seal on Menma to cut off the flow of Nine Tails Chakra. The sudden halt to power and adrenaline made Menma feel lightheaded. He was suddenly met with a rush of pain from his left cheek. He already felt a nice bruise forming as he spit out some more blood. Naruto was standing now, Ace still seated as if nothing interesting happened at all. Ah, you gotta love family reunions, Ace said offhandedly. Naruto let out a chuckle as he walked up to Ace. You got that right, Naruto then extended a hand towards Ace. Pay up bitch, I told you he would attack me. Ace let out a light-hearted sigh and reached into his pocket. He pulled out a small stash of Ryo and handed it to Naruto. Yeah, yeah. Ace took a moment to look at Menma who was now being tended to by a Tsunade. Nice punch. Naruto let out a snort of laughter before he heard a sniffle come from behind him. He turned to see his sisters still standing in the same position. Both had tears rolling down their face, Narumi a little more expressive than Mito. When he made eye contact with them, Narumi suddenly sprinted towards him. Unlike with Menma, she was running with her arms outstretched, much like her mother had done. Naruto was at a loss for a moment. He didn't know whether to dash away like he did with his mother or allow his sister to hug him. He would have had time to react, but he was caught off guard by Narumi's presence. She had one of the purest, kindest auras he had ever felt. That moment of hesitation was all Narumi needed as she slammed into her brother at full speed, making Naruto take a few steps back to keep from falling over. Naruto was stunned for a moment as he sat there, his sister crushing him in a hug and crying into his chest. He wanted to push her off but couldn't sense any negative emotion directed at him, from her at least. She was full on sobbing into Naruto's chest. The tears only flowed harder as she felt Naruto awkwardly warp an arm around her. He couldn't explain why he did it. He just did. As much as he wanted to be mad, he couldn't bring himself to hurt Narumi. He remembered her always following him around when they were little, constantly wanting to play with him and hang out with him. Even when their parents began to focus on the triplets, Narumi would always go out of her way to spend time with Naruto. Naruto didn't have the same feeling of hatred and disgust when he saw Narumi. Instead, he saw an innocent girl that was hurt by his actions, no matter how justified they may have been. When he looked at her, he couldn't help but feel guilty for what he did. While he hated his parents, godparents, and wasn't exactly adored by his other siblings, he couldn't imagine how Narumi must have taken him leaving. Narumi turned to face Ace, tears still pouring down her beautiful face. She tried to calm down for a moment as she had something to say. T thank you. Thank you for bringing my Nichan back to me. The blonde was overwhelmed with sobs again as she held on to Naruto like her life depended on it. Mito stood by the door, not having moved much since she saw her brother. She was crying silently, in joy or anger she couldn't tell. A part of her wanted to do the exact same thing as Narumi and cling desperately to her brother, the other part wanted to do what Menma did except hope for a better outcome. While a part of her felt jealous for her expressive attitude and willingness to put herself out there, especially when it seemed to win over her estranged brother, she was glad at her more reserved nature, because she might have been spared the bone-crushing punch Menma took. Mito was so unsure of her emotions, she was disturbing the Nine Tails within her. The Nine Tails looked through the bars of her cage to see the eldest sibling looking back at him. The strongest of the tailed beasts noticed something was off about the boy but knew that with the emotional strife his container was in, that it would be best to let things play out for the moment. He could inquire about her brother at a later date. Kushina watched her daughter and son with great envy. She knew that she was largely to blame for Naruto leaving in the first place and that she deserved every part of how he treated her, but all she wanted right now was to hug her son like Narumi was doing. She had calmed down for the most part, not wanting to be an emotion wreck in front of her kids, but was still letting a constant stream of tears run down her face. She stood next to her husband who had sat back down in his chair behind his desk. Menma was shrugging off the last of Tsunade's healing, annoyed with how his sister had immediately forgiven their brother. He went to stand next to Jiriai off to the right of his father's desk. His father then signaled for Narumi and Mito to join them on that side of the desk. Mito made her way over and slowly and reluctantly Narumi let go of Naruto. As she walked over, she wiped off her face with some tissues she picked up from her father's desk. She found a spot next to her mother. Her mother pulled her into a quick hug while Mito stood off to the left side of the group, obviously lost in her own thought. Ace let out a groan as he stretched, eventually getting up from the couch and standing a little behind Naruto. 
They stood at their position in front of the desk and eyed Naruto's family. A smile stretched across his features, home, sweet home, huh? Ace joked, uck, this is gonna be a pain in the ass, Naruto rubbed the bridge of his nose for a moment before he looked back at his family, listen up, I'm not saying this shit twice. Chapter 4, Questionable Choices Ace had spent the last hour or so on the sideline. He watched the Sanin, triplets, and Naruto's parents as Naruto gave a brief summary of their time together. Over the years, Ace had grown to hate these people. Everything he was capable of, but the most basic desires in life always evaded him. The memories of a happy family were distant in his mind as he watched the dysfunctional batch in front of him. As Ace listened to Naruto talk, he couldn't help but think about what he would tell his parents if he could see them one last time. Would he tell them about his powers, or his goals? What would they think of him? Would he crack jokes or be emotional? It was hard to tell. Ace usually used humor as a way to deal with the hardships he had faced. If he could make people happy, if he could make people laugh, Ace would get to experience happiness through them. It was very desirable after years of miserable isolation. Throughout his life, every time things look up for him, everything fell apart. On more than one occasion Ace had contemplated ending it. Ending the pain. Ending the sadness. He came close a few times. He slit his wrists at the age of seven, only for them to heal. He threw himself of a building at six. His organs grew back. His bones returned to their original positions, and Ace had to deal with every painstaking moment of it. You do a lot of thinking after a failed suicide attempt, even more after two. It took the second failure for Ace to realize that if he gave up, then all those that died for him will have died for nothing. His mother and father, his sister, his teachers, his friends, all of them. Ace decided he would carry on because when he died, so did the last parts of those close to him. As long as he fought on, their legacy lived on. He would make the most out of the time he has been given. He would travel the universe, helping as many as he could. Ace would then return home to fix the corrupt system that forces children into a militaristic society, where all that matters is how strong you are and how many people you can kill. How many had he killed over the years? Thousands? Hundreds of thousands? Millions? It's hard to keep track when you have done nothing but fight and kill for nearly three quarters of your life. Ace never liked fighting. Everywhere he went, the strong seemed to love fighting and killing. It made sense to him. They enjoyed what they were good at. Ace didn't. Ace merely stomached the slaughters. He had to abandon May things over time. Friends. Lovers. His humanity. After everything that Ace had been through, he realized that if you don't get close to people, if you feel no remorse your enemy, and if you worry about yourself and only yourself, you can survive just about anything. Ace was willing to give his life to achieve his goal. He would end the indoctrination system that strips children of their choices. He would be the last outcast. He would be the last to lose everything. He would be the last to be hunted. Ace was ready to kill everyone that stood in his way. Ace had become a machine. The only thing he worried about was his goal. The ends justified the means. When Ace met Naruto, everything changed. Ace's emotionless state was interrupted. Naruto made him desire a normal life, even if he knew it would never happen. Ace had grown close to Naruto, closer than he had to anyone in a long time. So as they stood in front of those that were the source of Naruto's misery, Ace was conflicted. On one hand, he absolutely detested those in front of him. They had caused the one person he cared about unimaginable pain. But if they didn't, then Ace and Naruto never would have met. He had grown very protective of the blonde over the years and even considered hunting down his former family and killing them himself. The only thing that stopped him was his respect for Naruto. Ace knew that it was Naruto's choice, and he would help any way he could. If Naruto wanted to forgive and move on with life, Ace would be there, helping Naruto out when he needed it. If Naruto wanted to reduce the hidden leaf to a pile of rubble and a mountain of corpses, it wouldn't be the worst thing Ace had done. That was just the type of person Ace was. His undying loyalty for those close to him had led him into a few sticky situations in the past, but he thought it was worth it. He would protect, fight with, or aid his friends in any way he could, but if you betrayed or took advantage of him, there is nothing in the universe that would keep you from dying by his hand. After traveling all over the universe, meeting all kinds of people, Ace had learned a lot about himself. One was that the anger he held for his enemies was more powerful than any weapon that could be used against them. It was his greatest asset, but his biggest weakness. Another thing was just how selfish people are. When Ace was growing up, he never stayed in one place for long. Ever since his parents died, Ace did whatever it took to survive. He killed, stole, ran, and hid when he had to. Ace didn't like thinking about his past much. It wasn't exactly rainbows and sunshine. But as Ace watched Naruto tell his story to his family, Ace couldn't help but wonder what it would be like to have a family, to have anyone. Those that took his family from Ace were going to be here soon. Ace was ready for them. 
He had laid his trap, spending his time studying this world and waiting for his moment to lay the bait. They were coming soon. Ace was sure of that. That was good, it had been a while since Ace let out his frustration. He just had to make sure that Naruto and other innocents from this world didn't get caught up in the crossfire. When legions go all out, things tend to get a bit catastrophic. On more than one occasion Ace had destroyed entire continents, leading to thousands upon thousands of casualties. It's hard to care about civilian casualties when your enemies don't. Ace had to abandon his morality if he wanted to survive. They had made him into the monster that they feared so much. He hadn't cut loose in a few years, which worried him. He had only gotten stronger since then. The last thing he wanted to do was kill everyone on this planet because he wasn't prepared for his pursuers. No, he had to be ready, and he needed to have someone influential on his side. Ace had initially planned on just passing through, maybe spending a few days on the planet before he continued his evasion, but when he saw Naruto on the Hokage Monument, he felt something he hadn't in a while. Humanity. When he looked at Naruto, he saw himself at five, having nowhere to go, no one that accepted him. He knew firsthand the pain loneliness brings, and he couldn't just stand by and let Naruto grow up in misery. He watched the boy for a few months, curious about how the son of someone so important could live such a miserable life. It didn't take him long to find his answers. He saw the way Naruto's family interacted and nearly lost it. They neglected an innocent child, all because they were worried about some fucking prophecy. Ace lost track of how many times he wanted to kill them. It would have been a just sentence for their stupidity, but as he observed Naruto, he couldn't bring himself to do it. Ace would just be taking away the last few things Naruto had left. Then, Naruto's sixth birthday rolled around. He had planned on giving the boy a gift for a while constantly watching the boy to learn his interests. He was amazed by the work ethic and growth rate Naruto had. Every day, Naruto would go to the same place in the woods and practice chakra control, physically condition, or study books from the public library until he was so exhausted he could barely walk. On more than one occasion, Ace had found Naruto asleep in the woods and would sneak him into his room in his family's compound. Ace had a soft spot for the kid. Much like himself, Naruto didn't really have a place in the world. He was always seen as the other Namikaze, and the thought of dealing with that kind of treatment made Ace's blood boil. When Naruto decided to leave the Hidden Leaf with Ace, there were many uncertainties. They weren't sure what they were going to do or where they were going, but they knew that they had each other's back. Over the years the two bonded. Ace saw Naruto as a little brother, even though Naruto grew and matured much faster than he did, Ace did his best to teach Naruto things not just about fighting, but things he would need to know, like how to deal and communicate with people, logical thinking and a sense of morality that Ace had lost years ago. Ace snapped out of his thoughts as he listened to Naruto complete his story. He did a quick look over of those behind the desk and came to a few conclusions. The first thing he noticed was the immense guilt, frustration, and self-loathing coming from the adults. Ace tapped into their minds for a moment, curious at their train of thought. Minato was trying to come up with a logical way to grow closer to Naruto. He knew that Naruto wouldn't exactly welcome them back but he seemed determined to fix this rift between his eldest and the rest of his family. In the back of his mind, he was trying to get a gauge for how strong Naruto might be. He was quite shocked when Naruto swatted a Ninetales enhanced Menma like a fly. Naruto had also shown extraordinary speed in both his counter on Menma and evading his mother. He figured it would be safe to say that Naruto should at least be a Genon, but he wasn't going to bring it up yet. He cared more about what had happened to his son over the past decade. He was shocked at the sheer range of their travels. Ace and Naruto had visited all the major nations and even gone to the battlefields of the Hidden Mist Civil War. He felt guilty for not being there when Naruto experienced such horrors, but from what he could tell, Naruto and Ace were extraordinarily close. While he was sad about being replaced by Ace, he completely understood why his son did so. He wanted to thank Ace for looking out for his son. Ace scoffed. As if I did to for you. He thought as he shifted his attention to Narumi, the youngest of the Namikaze Uzumaki was in awe of her brother's story. Her mind was overflowing with questions as the emotions seemed to calm down. Ace couldn't help but smile at her innocence. He noticed how pretty she was earlier, but had to acknowledge it again now that she had stopped crying. He grinned at the look of curiosity that was present on her face. No wonder Naruto couldn't stay mad at her, Ace thought as he listened to her overwhelmingly joyous thoughts, all of them revolving around Naruto. Her older sister was a different story though. When Ace listened to Mito's thoughts, he couldn't help but feel sorry for her. Her emotions were so conflicting he could barely make sense out of it. He had to commend the girl though, even as a civil war of epic proportions went on in her head, she didn't miss a single word in Naruto's story. Ace noticed a disturbance deep within her. Upon further inspection, he discovered an agitated Ninetales. 
Rather than confronting the beast, Ace went back to Mito's thoughts and a few things caught his attention. The girl seemed to have put up barriers to cope with the loss of her brother. When Ace looked through her memories, Mito felt largely to blame for Naruto leaving. Her love for Naruto was undeniable, but she seemed to have distanced herself from the fond memories she had of Naruto. Instead, Mito seemed to have a lot of angry memories with Naruto. Ace put a pin in her for the moment, because he felt a great pulse of anger for Minma. As Ace shifted his attention to Naruto's brother, he was hit with a wave of negative emotions directed towards him and Naruto. It took him a moment to find the reason for the animosity. When he finally did, his interest was piqued. Flashback, one week before Naruto left the village. Setting, a small park next to the village orphanage. Menma, Mito, and Narumi were enjoying their day like they usually did. Their mother had brought them to the park to play with the other shinobi children. Menma was spending his time with Kiba Inuzuka, Shikimaru Nara, and Choji Akamiki. Mito and Narumi were playing with Hinata Hayuga and Dino Yamanaka. Suddenly Menma heard his name being called. He turned to see his sister standing next to a few older kids. The boys were around 10 years old. Menma could feel something off about them, but didn't know what it was. He walked over to them and Narumi turned to him. Hey, Nichan, Narumi said. She was wearing a clean white dress and had her hair in her usual pigtails. I was asking these guys if they had seen Narutoni. They were going to take us to see him. Ever since Naruto had gotten rejected on his request to train with his parents, he wasn't in the house much. He used to play with them all the time, often tickling them and making them laugh for hours on end with his cheesy jokes. Menma loved Naruto deeply. He always looked up to him, but for nearly a year now, Naruto had become increasingly distant. A few weeks ago, the triplets came up with the idea of surprising Naruto with a surprise play session. The only problem was that they needed to find him. They asked everyone they knew, but no one knew where their brother went during the day. They were super excited when these kids said they knew where he was. Come on, follow us, the biggest kid said as he started walking into the woods. They must have walked for a good 10 minutes before Mito finally asked where they were going. You said you wanted to see your brother, remember? The boy's face had a sick smirk as he reached down and picked up a stick from the ground, you wanna know something? None of the triplets could speak. The watched as five more kids joined the group of four that led them out there. A foreboding feeling settled in and they suddenly became very nervous. None of them could speak as they watched the older kids surround them. You three killed our parents, the boy's words confused them. The triplets tried to cry out, but no one heard them. Fear settled in as Mito and Narumi began to cry. Menma tried to fight back, but took a hit to the cheek that left a cut a few inches long. Menma fell to the ground as the boys laughed. You damn foxes killed my parents, my grandparents, and my sister, I won't let you get away with it. He raised up his arms, the stick positioning itself above Menma's down form. We are going to kill the foxes and avenge our family. The boy swung down with all he might. Mito and Narumi watched in horror as the stick descended on Menma. In the blink of an eye, a yellow blur positioned itself over Menma. Everyone heard the stick make contact with something and snap. Menma's eyes were closed, waiting for the pain of the strike that never came. He slowly opened his eyes to see Naruto standing over him, using his arm to block the stick. Blood ran down Naruto's arm and fell onto Menma's cheek. Everyone's eyes widened as they saw the eldest Namikaze kick the older boy in the stomach hard enough for the boy to lose his wind. As the first boy fell, two others charged at Naruto, their sticks ready to strike. Mito and Narumi tried to warn their brother, but Naruto was more worried with getting Menma out of the way. He took the hits, one to his ribs and the other to the side of his head. He fell to the ground as he yelled to Menma, Get them and run! Naruto's voice was distressed as he scrambled away from the rest of the boys. Not seeing any other option, Menma ran to his sister, helped them to their feet and ran back down the path they came from. Mito and Narumi were crying even harder now as Menma tried his best to keep it together. Behind them they heard a lot of yelling and the sound of sticks hitting flesh. After a while they started to hear the sounds of fists hitting flesh, unsure of who was winning, they ran as fast as they could until they reached the edge of the forest. They stopped for a moment to catch their breath as they looked frantically for their mother. Right as they were going to call out to her, they heard rustling in the bushes behind them. The triplets turned around in horror, only for to be relieved a moment later. They saw the heavily wounded form of their brother push through a bush and stumble towards them. His blue shirt was in tatters and covered in blood, most of it his own. He had cuts and welts all over his body, the right side of his head was bleeding, his right eye was swollen shut and his mouth was dripping with blood. Tears fell from their eyes as they ran to him, embracing him in a hug like they used to have. Naruto winced a bit at first, then wrapped his arms protectively around his siblings. They cried into his chest for a few minutes before Menma spoke. Naruto ni, I'm sorry. 
You got hurt because of Menma was cut off by Naruto who pulled them all in tighter. Mito and Narumi were thinking the same thing as Menma, but were still sobbing. Dummy, Naruto started. It's a big brother's job to protect his little brother and sisters. Naruto let off a hundred watt smile, showing them his now bloody teeth as he held his siblings close. Enni chan, Narumi started, looking up at Naruto. W what did those kids mean we are the fox? D did we hurt people like they said we did? Narumi quivered as she spoke, sobs still racking her delicate frame. Naruto responded with a soft chop to the top of her head. Don't be a dummy like Menma, Naruto said, his smile growing wider. Even though the pain he was feeling didn't dull, you are Narumi, just like always. Naruto looked down at Mito who was still clinging to him, you are Mito. Then he looked back over to Menma, and you are Menma. Don't let anything those dummies say bother you. You three will always be my family and as long as I'm here, I won't let anyone hurt you. As Naruto finished, his siblings crying intensified as they finally let out the fear and worry they had. Naruto couldn't help but smile softly, he felt happy. Something he hadn't felt for a while. Flashback end. Ace remembered that day. He watched the entire scene play out. He watched as Naruto beat all the boys, choosing to go for pressure point takedowns or choke outs, hoping to hurt them as little as possible. The loneliness they felt was well known by Naruto. He knew what it was like to not really have a family. He didn't hate the boys for feeling the way they did, but he wasn't just going to let them beat up his siblings for it. After Naruto calmed his siblings down, he asked them not to tell their parents about what happened. He didn't want the orphans to feel their mother's wrath for trying to beat her children. They reluctantly agreed, but were concerned for Naruto. He told them not to worry, he was going to be fine. Naruto didn't go home that night. He slept on top of the Hokage monument after trying to patch up his injuries. While he slept, Ace went down and healed the boy. He admired what the boy did, but was a little against how gently he took down the orphans. Ace was pulled from his reflection once again as he saw another memory that Menma had, this one from about a month after the first flashback, three weeks after Naruto left. The same park next to the orphanage. The village was on high alert for the months following Naruto's disappearance. Minato was pulling out all the stops mobilizing thousands of shinobi in an attempt to find his eldest. Menma, not wanting to be left out, wandered the village every day looking for his brother wherever he could think of. Most of the time Menma would just wander around, wondering to himself why his brother left. Menma was more worried about his brother than anything else. He knew that Naruto was a very independent person, but to be gone for nearly a month after what happened at the party made Menma question if his brother would ever return. Menma was pulled from his thoughts and found himself at the same park from a few weeks back. The sun was setting and he figured it was about time to head back. As he was turning back to head home, Menma heard a few boys call out to him. When he turned back, he saw the same boys from a few weeks back. What are you doing here fox boy? The biggest one spat as the group surrounded Menma. Menma was immediately put on edge as he tried to find a way out. He spun around, trying to find a hole to escape. He found a small gap that was his best chance. Menma dashed for the gap as fast as he could but was caught in the arms of two boys. Menma struggled, trying to break from their grip, leave me alone, I'm just looking for my brother, Menma yelled, trying his best to hide his fear. His arms were held out by the bigger kids, Menma tried desperately to break free. Oh, the one that saved you last time? So I guess it's true, the only normal one in your family left, the boy let out an annoying laugh, the other boys following his lead, it was just a matter of time before he left a monster like you behind. Menma grit his teeth his blood boiling with rage. Shut up, he would never leave us, Menma spat, once again trying to break out of their grip, and failing once again. How stupid are you? The older boy mocked, he has been gone for almost a month. From what I heard, your parents took away the last thing he had left and gave it to you and your sisters. It must suck for him, he had his birthright taken away and given to a monsters like you. The boy lowered his head, getting right in Menma's face, a taunting grin making its way onto the boy's face. What's wrong fox boy? This can't be the first time someone told you the truth, the boy's smile grew, your brother never cared about you. And why would he? You are just a demon, and you deserve to be treated like one. Shut up, Menma shouted, swinging his head forward, smashing it right into the older boy's nose. He felt a blood chilling crunch against his forehead. The older boy lurched back, holding his now broken nose, blood pouring down his face. He looked right at Menma, rage oozing from both of them. The boy wound up a punch and hit Menma right in the jaw. He swung again, and again. His friends held Menma up as the blonde's knees buckled. After a few hits, the boy with the broken nose let up, only to be replaced by the other boys that were standing behind him. They all took their turns, knocking out teeth and breaking ribs. 
When Men Ma was nearly unconscious, they dropped him on the floor and all kicked him. That was where the Anbu found him, laying in a pool of his own blood, barely alive. Calling out for his brother to help him, his voice barely audible, Men Ma was rushed to the hospital, where Tsunade personally tended to him. His list of injuries was rather extensive. He had a broken nose, cracked cheekbones, a major concussion, broken jaw, shattered ribcage, and punctured lungs. His arms had been broken from when he tried to break free and tried to cover his face from the kicks. It took over 14 hours of constant medical attention and an 8-hour reconstructive surgery for Menma to even look like his old self. Menma didn't talk for a few days. He barely ate and slept. He just sat there coming to a realization. It's a big brother's job to protect his little brother, Naruto's words echoed through his head. He left me. Menma thought. He isn't here to protect us anymore. Menma thought. He bit his lip as he held back tears. We don't need him, Menma thought as a few stray tears ran down his cheeks. If he won't protect Mito and Narumi, then I will. Tears were now pouring out of Menma's eyes. Flashback end. Ace pulled out of the memory, his mind lost in thought. While he had been left in a much worse state than Menma, multiple times in fact, what Menma went through was something a child should never have to. Ace closed and opened his fist a few times to calm down. He looked over at the Sanin, who were listening intently. Jiraiya had a big part in the search for Naruto, using his spy network to try and search everywhere in the elemental nations. He grew quite desperate at one point, going as far as to enlist the help of the Toads. After that failed, Jiraiya lost all hope. He wanted to be the one to find Naruto, because in his mind, he was the reason Naruto left. At first, Jiraiya thought that Naruto was just hiding or ran away like a lot of kids do. After a few weeks, Jiraiya became quite worried for the blonde. The more he thought about the boy, the worse his guilt got. He thought about all the times that Naruto would ask him questions about being a shinobi. Most of the time Jiraiya blew him off, but there was one day that was far worse than any of the others. Flashback, three months before Naruto left. The Namikaze Uzumaki compound, living room. Naruto was sitting down on the couch, reading a book as Jiraiya came barging in. He was looking for the triplets, since they were going to be spending the day with him. In all honesty, Jiraiya forgot to invite Naruto and didn't realize his mistake until he saw the boy sitting alone on the couch. Menma, Mito, and Narumi heard the door open and rushed downstairs. They immediately jumped on their godfather, walloping him in a hug. They all greeted Jiraiya who couldn't help but let a smile wash over him. He was eventually able to push the triplets off him, their smiles never falling. All right, go tell your mother goodbye, I'll be waiting right here, Jiraiya said as he looked down at the triplets. They all gave a high in response before the scurried upstairs to find their mom. It was only then that Jiraiya noticed Naruto sitting on the couch, reading tales of a gutsy ninja. Jiraiya was a bit shocked at first, he didn't know Naruto was interested in his writing, or that he could even understand it. The last blonde looked up from the book and politely greeted Jiraiya. Jiraiya gave an uncomfortable nod as he kept eyeing the boy. Jiraiya-san, Naruto said as he looked at the sage, I was named after the character in this book, right? The question caught Jiraiya off guard. He replied honestly with a cocky smirk on his face. It was the next question that Jiraiya didn't know how to answer. Do you think I can accomplish his dream of bringing peace to the shinobi world? Naruto's words were hopeful and innocent, catching Jiraiya completely off guard. Unsure of what to say, Jiraiya just stared at the boy, his mouth slightly agape as he tried to speak. Before he got the chance, the triplets had come back downstairs, ready to leave. They dragged out Jiraiya as the man looked back at their brother. As the door was closing, Jiraiya saw a tear make its way down Naruto's face. Flashback end. That was the day Jiraiya regretted the most, aside from the day he brought up the prophecy. If he had just encouraged Naruto, maybe things could have changed. He will never forget the look of soul-crushing rejection Naruto had as he watched the author of his favorite book walk out the door after Jiraiya awkwardly ignored Naruto's question. Mistakes. They were the only thing going through Jiraiya and Tsunade's head as they listened to Naruto. Tsunade thought about the last time she spoke with the boy. Flashback. Two months before Naruto left, Tsunade's office, Leaf Village Hospital. Tsunade needed some sake. She had been sifting through applicants for medical ninjutsu training for hours and was getting nowhere. Why can't I find one applicant that is worth a damn? Sunday let out a frustrated huff and leaned down to the bottom drawer of her desk. She opened it to see a bottle of her favorite sake and a saucer. She leaned back in her chair as she poured herself a drink. As Tsunade was drinking her first saucer, Shizun walked in the office and scowled at her. You know you shouldn't drink while you're working Tsunade-sama. Shizun was 12 years old, but very mature for her age. Tsunade had begun personally training her in medical ninjutsu a few months back. The girl had promise. She wasn't much of a fighter, 
but she was quick-witted and determined to help people. Tsunade saw a lot of her Dan and Shizun. As the door was closing, she noticed a little blonde boy sneak in. She narrowed her eyes, looking past Shizun and staring right at Naruto. The boy approached humbly, his head bowed and his hands together in front of him. The boy was wearing his usual navy blue shirt and gray shorts. He walked up and stood next to Shizun, respectfully waiting to be addressed. Tsunade eyed him for a moment before she spoke. What do you need, Naruto? The boy didn't flinch at her tone. Instead, he looked up at Tsunade with a small smile on his face. I was wondering if you could help me with medical ninjutsu, Tsunade-san, Naruto said respectfully. Tsunade was confused for a moment, as was Shizun. They both shared a look before Tsunade questioned Naruto. I wasn't aware that Minato and Kushina had begun your training, Tsunade said, knowing for a fact that he wasn't being trained by his parents. Well, they haven't I just Naruto started but was quickly cut off by Tsunade. So, you haven't even started your shinobi training, but you want me to teach you medical ninjutsu? Her tone was a lot harder than before, but Naruto responded anyway. Well I have been training on my own and I Tsunade cut him off again. You really think that you trained enough by yourself to compete with the Chunin and Jonin that apply for my classes? Tsunade started at the boy, Naruto shifted uncomfortably under her gaze, because if you do, let me tell you something. Tsunade leaned forward in her seat her eyes burrowing into Naruto. You better get that ego of yours in check. I have had friends and family die because they thought they were stronger than they actually were. Nawaki and Dan flashed into her mind for a moment, so, don't waste my time with this. Your parents obviously have a reason for not training you yet. Stop being a spoiled brat and just listen to them. Tsunade's words were like daggers to Naruto, each one cutting deeper than the last. He gave a slight nod, bowed and walked out of the room. Closing the door gently behind him, Tsunade caught sight of tears running down his cheek as he closed the door. She immediately regretted being that hard on him. She could tell that he just wanted to better himself, but he wasn't being allowed to. While she was positive that he could work towards it in time, she wouldn't allow a kid to join her medical classes, child of the Hokage or not. Shizun watched the interaction in silence, waiting for Naruto to leave before speaking. You didn't have to be that hard on him, Shizun sounded a bit angry with Tsunade but also worried about Naruto. Tsuan let out a deep sigh. I know. I'm just a bit on edge right now. Tsuan finished her saucer and began to pour another. Flashback end. Tsuan couldn't bring herself to talk to Naruto after that. Whenever she thought about how she acted, she felt disgusted with herself. She knew Naruto was just looking for something to do, and his parents weren't training him yet. She just felt too ashamed to speak to him. She needed time to let it calm down. Maybe a month or two. Naruto left before Tsunade apologized. Over the years he was gone, Tsunade thought about their last meeting. It was much more than just wanting help with medical ninjutsu, or wanting someone to train him. That request was Naruto's last attempt to reconnect with his family. He was reaching out to everyone, and they all turned their backs on him. She had many nights where she thought about him all night, her guilt building to a near unbearable point. She began to drink more, hoping to forget. She never did. Naruto was finishing up his story now, telling them his purpose for returning. Ace stopped poking around in the minds of others and decided to just listen for the moment. So, just throw me on a Janan team, we will be ready for the Chunin exams coming up, Naruto was annoyed. He loved talking about his time with Ace, but didn't want to share any more with his family than he had to. He purposely left out the parts about his power and skill set, knowing that his parents and godparents were curious about that aspect. Naruto. The tuning exams aren't a joke, Kushina tried to lecture, but was cut off by Ace laughing hysterically. Kushina grit her teeth at the outburst and tried to respond respectfully. Is something funny? Yeah, Ace started, just cut that whole concerned mother shit before I piss myself. The smile never left Ace's face as he stared right at the seething red death. I'm his mother, it is my job to Kushina was cut off yet again by Ace. Yeah, you are his mother, Ace rolled his eyes, and might I say you are doing an absolutely stellar job. Sarcasm dripping from each word. Kushina clenched her fists, everyone in the room felt her chakra spike. She looked right at Ace with a glare that she wished would kill him. Leave, Kushina growled, I thank you for bringing back my son. Now leave here and never come back. Ah, What? You don't like actually getting criticized for your fuck-ups? Ace's smirk grew sinister, because if we are being honest, the only one in the room Naruto respects is me. I mean shit. He hates almost all of you all. Ace was pushing just the right buttons to piss everyone off. Minato was the only one keeping a cool head. Ace looked at Jiraiya. This whole thing started with you and your fucking prophecy, Ace spat. If you haven't noticed, the whole concept of a prophecy, is that no matter what you do, it happens anyway. So, 
you come down from the meeting with the toad sage waving you prophecy around like it is the answer to all your problems. If you haven't noticed, you cause more issues than you resolved. Jiraiya seemed to shrink under the criticism. He knew that every word of it was true. Ace looked over at Tsunade, who seemed to shudder under his gaze. You are just as bad. You see a sad, lonely kid and decide to just stand by and watch. Ace got ready for the final blow on her. I wonder what Dan and Nawaki would think if they saw what you did. Tsunade's eyes widened after hearing that. Ace decided to have some fun and help her envision Dan and Nawaki reacting to her recent actions. Ace took over Tsunade's already vulnerable mind, an evil grin face. In Tsunade's mind, Tsunade stood alone in a dark room, a soul spotlight shining down on her. Suddenly she hears a noise to her right. What she saw nearly made her heart stop. It was Dan with the injury he sustained on the day he died glaring at her with a hatred she had never seen before. How could you do that Tsunade? The image of Dan spat, how have you fallen so far as to push away a helpless child? Maybe it was good we never got the chance to have any. Tsunade began to hyperventilate under the pressure of her emotional distress. The image of Dan dispersed in a light breeze that blew through the room, revealing a form of Nawaki at the age of five. Rather than talk, this image went through Tsunade's memory of Naruto asking for help but in Naruto's shoes. Tsunade was bawling watching the scene play out. It only got worse when Ace showed Nawaki standing on the top of the Hokage monument crying, like Ace found Naruto the day they left. Ace decided to put a spin on things as he had the image of Nawaki stand up and mutter, since I'm not wanted and lean over the edge of the Hokage monument. Tsunade tried to run and grab him, but wasn't fast enough. Instead, she got a front row seat to the projection of her falling to his death. Thought projection end. Tsunade snapped back to reality. Only a second having passed while she saw everything Ace put in her head. She collapsed to her knees, a sobbing mess. Ace decided to move on. Don't even get me started on you, Ace said as he eyed Kushina. You've got some balls to try and act all motherly after the shit you put Naruto through. Kushina had heard enough from Ace and charged at him, intent on planting her fist right on his smug mouth. Ace grinned as he watched the red head barrel towards him. In the blink of an eye, Naruto stepped in between the two of them drawing his sword and putting it at has his mother's throat. Kushina slammed on the brakes to keep from splitting her throat open on her son's sword. She looked at Naruto, all of her anger shifting to sadness as she stood there, completely at his mercy. Naruto let out a low growl. If you pull some shit like that again, I swear to Kami, I'll kill you, Naruto's words made her skin crawl. No one in the room doubted what he said, no matter how much they wanted to. Naruto released a minimal amount of ki, making everyone in the room, but Ace, gasped for breath. Naruto eyed his mother for a moment, his blade as still as a statue. His mother began to quiver at the sight. Naruto seemed to be daring her. She backed away shakily, a look of horror on her face. Ace placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder. Getting the hint, Naruto sheathed the blade, and started shuffling through his bag, looking for something. Kushina was now a wreck again. The idea of her son threatening to take her life broke the dam as she sat wallowing in her own sorrow. Minato was going to go help his wife, but Naruto tossed a rather large bag of Ryo on the desk. Minato gave he a confused look, giving Naruto the cue to explain. That's for the penthouse of the shinobi barracks. Naruto's words were brief, but his meaning was the opposite. And Naruto, you don't have to. We can work something out. Minato gave his son a pleading look, trying to keep his emotions in check. Naruto turned to Minato, a cold look on his face. No, we can't. When you decide which team I'm on, send me the files of my teammates. I'll be busy for the next week, so don't bother stopping by. Naruto and Ace made their way out of the office, leaving behind a stunned Namikaze Uzumaki family. They had so many thoughts rushing through their head, too many for them to make sense out of. Minato knew there was one thing he needed to do before he tried to calm his family. Snake, Minyondo called out. Immediately, an Anbu donning a snake mask appeared, kneeing before him, waiting for a command. I want you to follow Ace. Find out as much as you can about him. Report to me every three days and if he leaves the village, send a message with one of your summons. The cloaked Anbu gave a firm nod, yes, Hokage-sama. The Anbu disappeared, off to tell her objective. Minato let out a sigh. As he looked around the room, he saw everyone but him and Narumi were in the middle of an emotional breakdown. His mind was on one thing. Naruto. Scene change, the streets of the Hidden Leaf. Ace and Naruto were making their way to the nearest furniture store, hoping to pick up some essentials for their new home. As Ace reached for the door, he felt a chill run down his spine. A sudden shift in the air and movement of a distant power made Ace's eyes widen. They are coming, Naruto understood what Ace meant immediately. How many of them? 
Naruto's voice filled with worry. More than I have ever faced before. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.